Hey y'all, the Chillmeister Chris Gary here. Just wanted to clarify a few things before this podcast begins. For starters, although this may feel like a typical crossing the seams episode, I can assure you, this ain't one of those things. The We Are Rising podcast that myself and Andrew Benjamin host, and the Broughton Horizon podcast that Drake Riggs hosts alongside Rising Fighting Federation Everyman, not to mention the booker, Shinko Kashiwagi, are two completely different shows with the same type of structure to give you, the listening public, a deeper and more detailed perspective on the Rising Fighting Federation and Japanese mixed martial arts than any other fight outlet around the world would attempt to give, aside from your usual New Year's headline or UFC signing to the promotion. No matter if you're listening to or watching either one of these programs, I assure you that your interest in Ryzen and JMMA will grow from having listened to them. Second, we recorded this podcast on Monday, September 21st, exactly six days before the event. As of the morning of September 23rd, which is about 72 hours and change before the event, possibly 96, a bout switch has been made. The bout that we spoke of as being the second match on this card, a kickboxing bout between Yuki Kitagawa and Taishi Hiratsuka, has been switched up to the seventh bout on the 11 fight card, in place of what would have been in that time frame, Rasta versus Mutsuki Ibata, the twin brother of Rui Ibata. All the other bouts on that card that we'll be talking about are as they are in the event's bout order. And finally, as if it needs to be said, Although this is a fight preview podcast, the following show contains some strong language and talks of violence in one way or another. This podcast may not be acceptable to listen to for those under the age of 18 or with soft listening habits. Listener discretion and viewer discretion are both strongly advised. With that being said, let's get on with the show, baby. everybody or ladies and gentlemen what's good y'all it's andrew benjamin it's chris gary and you're tuned in to yet another edition another special edition so to speak of the we are rising podcast your show for all things about the rising fighting federation and japanese mixed martial arts or In our due time, we just love to shoot the shit and just talk about things like pop culture and other issues. You can follow us on Twitter, respectively. I'm at ChrisGary92 on Twitter. Andrew is at Abenja1. The show handle is at WeAreRisingPod. W-E-A-R-E-R-I-Z-I-N-P-O-D, all in one word. And you can check out our podcast on Stitcher, SoundCloud, YouTube, Podbean, and all other podcast providers of choice, hopefully. But, the reason why I say this is another special edition of the podcast is because I feel like we're being invaded or some sort. I feel like this is a crossover episode between a certain podcast that just made its debut. And... Let me go ahead and get this out the way. This man is from Vancouver, Washington, USA, and he just got through doing a new podcast of his own called the Broaden Horizons Podcast, H-O-R-I-Z-I-N-S, and that man is a man that you might be familiar with, you the audience that is. His name is Drake Riggs. How are you doing, sir? (laughs) <laughs> I appreciate the intro there, man. I am doing good. Always glad to, you know, talk about fighting with great people. 
Oh, great, great. Well, we're glad to be, know that we're both great people. Uh, <laughs> we've earned that distinction. Uh, but, uh, yeah, Dre, just tell us a about yourself. Uh, how did you get into this uh, crazy sport of uh, this, this position of MMA journalism? How did, how did it all start out for you, and where did you go? How did you wind up from point A to uh, here? You know, it's it's a funny story, kind of, because I really never intended, you know, to be a writer and interview fighters and everything like that. I started out as a fan, as, you know, surely most people do for the most part and everything. And um, as for MMA in general, really, I was at first growing up, you know, a real hardcore WWE pro wrestling fan, as, you know, I guess a lot of people might be when they grow up, which I've always found kind of weird. And, you know, I look back and I'm like, why do I like wrestling so much, you know, because as you get older, you're like, ah, this is, you know, not real fighting. And, you know, once I realized that and saw MMA for the first time I was like holy shit this is awesome this is the real deal and it just like completely converted me right away on first sight um and that was about in like 2009 I want to say um because I'm 24 right now I'll be 25 next month so yeah in terms of getting into the actual MMA media industry though so in about 2010 you know I became really hardcore watching MMA as much as I possibly could and I found my way to the Sure Dog forums. Um shout out to those guys, I guess. <laughs> just cuz you know, they they really helped get me to where I am because I would just post, you know, like a regular poster and everything. Was doing that for a couple of years until I just kind of, you know, slowly worked my way up and got promoted to be a moderator of the forums and then eventually administrator and then I started doing um fighter Q&A. Uh, sessions and so that was kind of the foot in the door to actually doing any type of media stuff right and so eventually after doing so many of those i was like you know we could do like recap articles of these and you know put them on like the main site rather than just the forum part um so i i brought that up and i eventually started doing that a little bit and i so i would write those articles and put them out there and just eventually you know broke off from sure dog and wanted to do more writing specifically and um yeah it kind of it kind of really just took off that way it was just a matter of me being such a fan and you know hey here's an opportunity where i can maybe talk to these guys it just happened real naturally i didn't ever plan on it but it's been it's been fucking awesome so yeah <laughs> and now you currently write for i believe my mma news correct yes my mma news i'm the lead mma manager and editor managing editor at uh, the scrap fan site at mma i also write for rt sport do video stuff with them um and I'm gonna get back into doing some video stuff with the body lock as well oh but you don't 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 kill the lead we got to talk about your most important uh contribution <laughs> broaden horizon which is that a pilot episode Appreciate that. Appreciate that. But I, st I think my pinnacle is still my Megumi Fuji story as of late. But um, <laughs> yes, yes, the the podcast, which is brand new, which follows right after that, actually. And of course, I had Megumi on that very first episode. Amazingly, to talk to her again. Uh, yeah, brought in Horizon, brand new, um, you know, project I've started, and it really kind of came to me one day. I I don't remember why. I, you know, this idea popped in my head, but I was like, you know, I can make this happen. I think that there is a lack of uh international and more specifically american media like let's take an example you know the top guys i don't have to name the websites but you know exactly what i'm talking about the, the yeah. top websites that you know they don't really care for you know japanese mma or you know most international mma for that matter and just thinking about it like well you know rising it's not like they're pushovers they're obviously a top five worldwide organization in mma a top five top you could argue top three some of their fighters are the absolute best in the world you know we're seeing more and more of them come over and do their thing in the ufc you know yuri just got the great win over vulcan and then manel capes making his way and you know there's others i'm surely not naming off the top of my head but yeah they have some of the best guys and it was like you know we i could i could try and give them some more spotlight too you know i know that it, it's not hard to interview them this way. You just got to go a little bit of the extra mile. And so that was kind of the idea behind Broaden Horizon and the, the kind of, you know, the cleverness to it, I guess, if you want to say, is in, it's in the title. You know, we're trying to broaden the horizon of the exposure limits for these fighters who are more secluded to one area of the world, obviously. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, so the, the, the podcast is going to be, uh, you know, before and after every Rising event is the idea right now. I got episode two. Dropping uh, on Wednesday, the latest we're recording here on Monday, so you guys can look forward to that before Ryzen 24. Got a, another great lineup, three fighters who are competing on the event, and then uh, one who's a little bit of a special guest again. <laughs> I see, I see. But here's the thing when it comes down to, you know, how international MMA journalists view Ryzen. 
Unless there's a big UFC signing or unless there's something like a Floyd Mayweather sighting or a big New Year's Eve show, they don't really cover Ryzen at all. If anything, when yeah. they do, it's like a niche little, it's like a little vanity project, so to speak, like ours, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's, I don't know, I just think that if they were to, or more people in general were to really try and, you know, bring things to the forefront in our part of the world that the fans and people watching the sport, you know, they would kind of be forced to see it and realize like, okay, wow, you know, that is very interesting over there. Of course, they, they would have to, you know, wake up a little bit earlier to watch the fights live and all that, but man, it is so worth it. Like when I saw my first Ryzen event, like watching it live and everything, I was like, damn, man, people are really missing out. This was an awesome show and, you know, they're always pretty awesome. Um, and, and the fighters are obviously great. So it's, it's just one of those things where, Hey, if you want to watch good MMA, it's not only in one part of the world, you know. Do you think the the lack of coverage, though, is, I don't know, is almost deliberate by more than... Do you think that just that most... Let's just say, you know, most most of uh, the, uh, the public cage out there just cover UFC. Maybe yeah. KJ Bellator and, you know, the occasional bare knuckle. But do you think that, like, most of the promotions and, I guess, the, the more well-known... Uh, media talking heads out there, I think they deliberately just don't pay attention to what's going on in Ryzen. I'm, I'm not going to say JMA MMA in general, because mm-hmm. listen, I don't expect most people to cover Deep or Shuto or Pancras. Now it's not on the UFC Fight Pass anymore. But with Ryzen, their stuff is available internationally. They do adequately good English outreach, I'll say. Uh, to get the fires, you know, so uh, you get the information about the fires out there to English audience. Do you think that the, the coverage is just that they it's just not covered because I don't know, just MMA Western media is just not interested in anything besides USC and Bellator. I think that you know, obviously, the demand is for the UFC and Bellator and the things that are closer to you and. I guess more relatable and what, you know, obviously it doesn't fall entirely on the journalists and, you know, the people putting out and making the content specifically because they have their employers who are like, all right, you know, focus on these things. But at the same time, I do feel like it is a bit of, and this is going to sound offensive, you know, to some people probably, but a little bit of laziness to not try and go and find these stories and make them actual interesting stories as opposed to the easy route of going with, you know, the clickbait bullshit that is a lot more prevalent in all types of media. You know, it's, and I think that might be a culture thing too, just because of the language barrier. So they have to do a little bit more work, like I'm saying. So I I think it's just a matter of, of, uh, of both of those things, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, no, I get what you're saying. I get, no, no, it's, uh, it, it, I understand what you're saying, you know. I mean, listen, you know, there, I mean, you know, what will get the most uh, amount of clicks? Connor's latest tweet or a, <laughs> a, a story about Kintaro returning to, uh, Ryzen? No, yeah, I, 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 there'll be more people probably giving a shit about what Kobe Covington said about LeBron James than yeah. what Tenshin Nasukawa is going to be doing prior to the main event of this card here. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, uh, we're glad that somebody who is in the, uh, who does have a, a major voice in the MMA media world, that you're, we're glad that you're taking it on, you know, that you, def- that you you know, uh, even before Born on Horizon, you would, you would do live tweeting of the of Horizon shows, and also, you know, I know you're on the West Coast, so it's a little bit easier for you to stay up, but still, nonetheless, yeah. you stay up to about 3, 4, 5 p.m., you know, watching a show, you know, that's going five, six hours long, so, you know, we do applaud you for that. Well, thanks, man. I appreciate it. You know, I just, I just love the, the shows that they put on and the fighters. I like good MMA. That's really what it comes down to. And, you know, my whole thing about being really in the MMA media world and everything, it's, it's funny. I really don't consider myself like a journalist because I know that there's a certain like stigma or definition people like to put on that. I just consider myself a writer because I literally write about MMA, you know, and, you know, you could say podcast or whatever. You talk to fighters and all that. But my thing has always been, <laughs> Uh, you know, I've done, I haven't done, I'm not, I'm not going to say I've been a clickbait or, or anything, but, you know, I've done the news lines, the basic news stories and stuff in the past and everything. I don't do that as much anymore. I've turned my focus, you know, more to storytelling and everything because I think that's the most important part of really 
you could say any type of media because it's all about without these people and showing them respect and telling their stories, you, we have nothing. So you don't want to backstab them and just do little nonsense. You know, you do it. Let's say you do a full, uh, you know, let's say 20 minute interview with, I remember this is an actual prime example, like Ally Quinta and he meant, he mentions Connor for like one, you know, 10 second clip of that interview. And that makes the headline of the whole story. Like you yeah. realize that you could have made something a lot more special to him <laughs> out of this, right? So that kind of stuff, it, that drives me crazy, first of all, that kind of situation. And so I've tried to, you know, purposefully mold what I'm doing around the the antithesis of that. So, I got you. Um, yeah. Uh, um, I will say, though, also, you also have a, a probably coolest, real, I'm assuming your real name, uh, Drake Riggs. It sounds, that sounds like an NXT wrestler name that they would just give like, a new wrestler just came in. So you definitely got the coolest name among all the MMA writers, or I guess you call yourself content creator. Content creator. MMA content creator. Is that using all the kids now? Content creator? Influencer? I don't know. Um, <laughs> it works. <laughs> but we do actually, we do have a question uh, from a listener for you, Drake, um, our friend Luke. Uh, he wants to know, what do you want to see rise in realistically do to deepen the international uh, deepen the relationship between the promotion and the international fan base and he also thanks for the work and the shows everybody does and uh, that includes yours as well so yeah what, what do you think that rising can do just help deepen that relationship between uh that inter- the international fan base uh which seemed pretty big pre-pandemic probably financial reasons post-pandemic or i guess current pandemic it seems that lesson well, yeah, what in your mind could they do to just get that back? Yeah, that's a, uh, that's a, uh, well, appreciate the kindness, of course, from uh, Luke. Um, yeah, it's a very good and I think a pretty complicated question, you know, because obviously I, I can give some backstory here. I'm doing my thing, you know, working with, you know, Ryzen and, you know, doing the run Ryzen. Um, but, you know, I'm not being paid or anything. This was my idea entirely to go and reach out to them and everything to do this show. So, it's it's like what can they do specifically and you know looking at what i did this was all on me to you know try and help expand this and th- that part of the market for them what they could do um was maybe try reaching out themselves to other people and you know get more of uh that part of the voice out if that makes sense i don't know it's you you want to see that expansion and you know, let's say, for example, even an American show someday, that would be a really good start, I think. But there are some you got to think about. This is a good point um, that I thought of recently. If they were to come over and do a stateside show, then it wouldn't really have that same rise and feel because one, the first big one would be, well, they would have to change the rule set to, you know, the unified rules of MA and everything. We wouldn't have what we're always used to. Um, and, of course, you know, setting the stage up and everything, having to bring all their equipment overseas, or if they were to do it here, you know, go through an American company or whatever, it would look a lot different. Like, that's probably the reason that Pride only did, what, like two American shows, like towards the end yeah. of their run and everything. Um, so... Shows. Are we talking about question? I'm saying they only did, I mean, Pride only did two American shows. Both of them were in Las Vegas prior to the end of their run. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I don't know. It's a really tricky, complicated question what they could do there. I mean, you you said a good point there how they do, you know, put some good emphasis on um, English stuff. And they do have, you know, their English Twitter account and everything, which is, you know, a good step. And more things like that, I think the, the simpler things are a good start to expanding uh, their overall reach and all that. But I don't know, man. Um, I'd love to hear what you guys think, because it's really, I think there's a lot of different things that come into play for how they can do that when, yeah, I don't know. What, what are your opinions? <laughs> well, simply, I think one of the things that, uh, you know, I think going back on fight would be the, is, you know, for live shows, not for, you know, two weeks after a fact would be the biggest factor. Because, oh, listen, you, I still get asked, is this show going to be on fight? Mm-hmm. I, like, the amount of messages I get at the end or that are, that are, that are replied to whenever I post something on Twitter, it's, is this show going to be on fight? And if I'm being still asked that at this point, when already two shows have not aired live on fight, that tells me that Rise is not going doing a good job of promoting uh, their own uh, streaming service. So I think 
so many people just used to fight for everything, just having MMA, wrestling, boxing. I think you kind of just have to go do it. They may not want to for financial reasons, but it's kind of like, it's kind of like, uh, it's like pay-per-view in the 90s, uh, you know, did everybody want to pay, you know, did all the promoters want to pay those astronomical uh, fees that, uh, you know, that pay-per-view wanted in the 90s? No, but listen, that, it was the, you had to dump the cards you had, and I think that fight's one of those, especially for anybody who's international, Europe, America, um, I know they did have one show on traditional pay-per-view here, simulcast on a flight as well, but I don't think people are going to buy a pay-per-view, uh, really, a, a Ryzen traditional pay-per-view. Um, English commentary would help, though, the amount of people who say that they would prefer no commentary, like, it still astounds me, that, like, like, so many people would rather hear nobody than, than, <laughs> than, than like, whoever they would hire, um... I think that's probably the best thing they could possibly do is just is get on fights. Because then I think they would definitely still get... You'd have a fight promoting them. But that was funny. You know, Fight never really did promote a lot of their shows, from what I recall, very heavily, as opposed well, to, like... actually, they did promote a few New Year's Eve cards, but... And then, okay. It's just a bit like, like a mean, they had a cards, hard time. Like, to me, they had a hard time promoting the Mayweather card. Oh, yeah, yeah. That was... An exception. Um, I also, you know, just putting, you know, all those press conferences and uh, those those snippet fire interviews. It'd be great to have English subtitles on them. I know Shingo probably wouldn't want to go through a two-hour press conference uh, subtitling everything that the <laughs> bar is saying. It's a hassle, something. man. Oh yeah, <laughs> but you know, I would maybe just maybe subtitle what the fighters are saying or yeah, anything yeah. that uh, anything important the cocky bar is saying or something like that. Or just have like highlights, maybe like a like. Okay, English subtitle highlights of the press conference. You know, just get the important mm -hmm. crap out. Um, that's like that's what they can basically uh, do. And yeah, maybe also just you know making their fighters more available to places like uh, Junkie or Sure Dog or other uh, entities, and saying, hey, you know, we have Kai Azakura available uh, for an interview. Uh, whatever, you know, and we'll, we'll be able to provide live translation or something. Listen, I know that they may not have to stay up late. I'm talking about uh, people in Ryzen and the fighters, but listen, you know, that can still help, you know. An, uh, an article anime junkie could go a long way um, in promoting a show like this. Um, I mean, yeah, I think that's what, that's what they can do. Christian, any thoughts? Oh, and also lower the pay-per-view price as well, but that's, that's, that's another issue. That's an entirely... That's another can of words I don't want to get to. But, uh, Christian, uh, what do you think? What can they do to broaden their English uh, international audience? I think the main thing they should do is not only try and work out a deal with Ryzen just to, you know, bring themselves back on pay-per-view. Well, actually, bring themselves back on iPay-per-view, but... No, it actually, what Ryzen should do is continue to work with Fight, but they should also drop down the prices for certain shows. Like, if we know yeah. that this show is going to be average, you know, they should drop the price down to, like, I think $9.99 or $14.99 or something like that, and then save your $21.99 show for New Year's Eve. Yeah. But I do no, think I that when it comes down to you know, getting the kinks out and working internationally, they do need to up their game a little bit. They do need to hire people who have backgrounds in JMMA, who do know how to speak ink. No, I'm not trying to sound disrespectful here, but hire people who know about the English language culture, hire people who actually speak English and know about Ryzen, and, you know, hire people that you know, have love for and respect for the sport and not treat it like it's some fucking shit show. I mean, I'm not trying to say that as a hiring plea for either one of the three of us, but hey. It's <laughs> 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 Shingo is basically a one man one man army for for when it comes to the English outreach. So he's doing a, a, he's doing a, a job that's basically a, should be a job for ten men. 
as one man is what he's doing. So, you know, we applaud him for all these, and also the matchmaking as well, booking and all that stuff. So he's doing a thousand jobs at once. Yeah, you know, as I think Luke, uh, when we had him on, was like, you know, just hire, hire 10, you know, interns from, you know, Tokyo University who are studying English or whatever, you know, make sure they have a sports background, you know, have them, you know, do work that stuff as well, you know, with, uh, with uh, English outreach so it doesn't have to be all one man. Um, and, you know, that way you can still field, like, field ideas, you know, maybe they'll have something, you know, marketing-wise or something like that. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, yeah, that's what they, they can do. I mean, other than having a show in America, you know, but that's, realistically, that's not happening for, I don't mean, know, we don't know how long. that's not happening anytime soon is what you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> definitely course, definitely yeah. not. <laughs> yeah. Um, or you know what, you know, if they, you know, the whole Bellator relationship, one of the things they can maybe do is try to show, do a show live on the CBS Sports, whatever that Bellator is That would on. be huge. That would be that, very That huge. would be great. Um, then, uh, I think that could help a lot as well. You um, know what? Yeah. Maybe they can do like what the whole Dream Glory thing did. If it doesn't work out live on New Year's Eve, have them do a tape delay show. Like on the first weekend, no, the second weekend of 2020, obvious. No, wait, actually, not the first. Uh, what am I trying to say? Basically, have <laughs> them do a, like, one-day delay show. Have them air the show on that Friday night, January 1st, New Year's Day. I mean, New Year's night. And then have the rest of the show play out on January 2nd. Uh-huh. I think that could work. I don't know. In this day and age, though, maybe Drake, you can comment on that. I don't know. I don't know. Live sports almost seems to have to be watched when it's going on. Would you agree with that at this point? You know, tape delay almost seems to be a curse at this point if you're doing um, that. I think that it definitely depends on the sport. Like, for example, I the only two sports that I watch are MMA and American football. And if you're you know, watching an entire game, you know, after it's happened already, that's something I can't say that I've. I've probably only done that like once or twice, and I've been a football fan like my whole life. It's just not as interesting when you know what's happening. And then there's so many – the NFL makes like big, nice highlight videos where you can see pretty much all the important stuff in one like 15-minute video, which is excellent. So, uh, yeah, in terms of football, definitely, and I'm sure you know other longer sports and whatnot, even though you know a full MMA card is generally about the same length, if not longer, actually, probably longer. So – but as for MMA, though, the thing about it is, I don't know, I feel like it's easier to avoid spoilers if you really want to and all that. So the tape delay thing uh, for MMA doesn't bother me as much for other sports. But um, To counter that, one thing I always heard people bitching about, Bellator, stop doing tape delay for your UK shows. That was like one thing I always heard about Bellator was like their UK shows were always tape delayed and people didn't like that. So I don't know. Do you think that Ryzen can... I don't know, get away with that, potentially. I mean, that's the only example I can think of when it comes to MMA tape delays. Yeah. <clears throat> um, could they get away with it? Yeah, probably. Uh, <laughs> I mean, people would still bitch about it, of course, because they'll bitch yeah. about absolutely anything. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> so, I mean, it is worth a shot. Why not try it out at least once, you know? <laughs> but, um, yeah, I don't know. It, it's, it's such an interesting thing. People want everything now, 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 right when it happens happens you know it's that binge culture so um it, it's kind of one of those things that why not experiment is the thing maybe we're getting that we're getting the new shoe rule for rise of 24 right it's like yeah. they're experimenting with this new thing which i'm sure we'll get into um you know maybe right now maybe later yeah. whatever so um yeah it's always good to try things out i guess you know i mean yeah. we can go yeah. into it right now but one more thing i mean when it comes down to the whole tape delay i mean you do remember I'm not sure if you're a basketball fan or not, but you do remember when the NBA used to have games on CBS late at night on tape delay, right? I'm not aware of this, no. <laughs> oh, my apologies. I mean, I forgot. You're good. under the age of... You are under the age of 40, so you wouldn't understand. <laughs> so am I. So is Andrew. But still, <laughs> point of the matter is when the NBA had, like, magic... I mean, Magic Johnson and Larry Bird, they still were doing tape-delayed games, so that means they were airing 
at least in this time zone, the central time zone, at 10.35 p.m. at night, which was 8.35 p.m. your time. Yeah. <laughs> so, basically, I don't know. Maybe it needs to... Maybe in order for Bellator... Maybe in order for Ryzen to not do any more tape-delayed shows, do what Bellator has done. Make a big move, you know, get some big stars, even though it would be hard to in this pandemic era, and make that splash for people to actually pay attention to you, not only on, I mean, not only on pay-per-view, but in case you want to have that CBS Sports deal to where you actually get to show more than one card. Yeah. Exactly, and th- I think that is probably the best point is getting the right platform for their visibility. You know, like we've mentioned, fight and everything. Like, sure, fight has been good, obviously, for most of their run and all that. But if they could somehow work out something with even like Bleacher Report, would probably be better. I know that obviously mm-hmm. one is doing stuff with them, but like, yeah, getting some kind of platform in the states where they can simulcast on that and then you know they got what is it fuji tv or whatever all the other things that they do in japan and whatnot um i mean even one they aired on what tnt for one cent one champion uh, century i think the century events yeah, which is also i think they that's also do like review shows or actually highlight shows on tnt yeah. as well yeah. Uh, actually, about that, Jake. They actually, have, well, what about doing something simulcast on a platform that everybody has? YouTube. I think they could or, do something like that. Maybe that would be a great have idea. Them, have <laughs> them have a simulcast on Pluto TV, which is something that's a free app that everybody should have by now. That's true. Uh, they could do Pluto TV, but I'll be honest. I don't. Th- I don't know if even Ryzen knows about Pluto TV. I'll be honest. <laughs> I didn't know about Pluto TV. Too. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> It, it's it's one of those one of those things that like it, it's like great but like nobody knows about it. Yeah, I didn't know about it, Christian, until you mentioned to me that uh, neither comet was on it, and that's how I watched the movie. So um, <laughs> it's a it's a good it's an interesting idea, but I don't know if 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 people are going to just download Pudu TV just to see Rise. And I think it's got to be on something that everybody already is familiar with or can, can easily access. And YouTube probably is the easiest. The other issue would be using Fight Pass, if it was on Fight Pass, but we don't want that because then the, the God only knows what the Fight Pass uh, bosses will want to dictate to Ryzen, and who knows what they'll cut out. So, yeah, that's, you know, YouTube seems to be the easiest, would be the easiest way they can maybe simulcast it or do, like, the first three fights for free on YouTube, and then, you know, kind of like a ESPN, uh thing or whatever UFC does, you know, watch the first three on this way and then the rest this way, or Bellator does. Um, With that being said, Christian, we do have to talk about this, what I think is an awesome card, uh, on paper at least, this Ryzen 24 card. So I'm going to let you start off. Uh, Take it away there, champ. Okay, let's go ahead and get this going. Because we got an 11 fight card, 8 Kick, no, we got an 11 fight card, 8 mixed martial arts bouts, 7 of which have 3 5 minute rounds involved, 3 kickboxing bouts including your main event of the evening, most of which have elbows allowed. But of course, if you want to talk about an instant fall from grace, we got to talk about the first fight. Obviously, that's Yuri O'Hara, who will be making his Ryzen debut after being a veteran of deep for so long, versus Yusuke Yachi, who just got KO'd by Roberto Satoshi de Sosa at Ryzen 23, 22, I think, 23, 22. Yeah, yeah. Main event. Oh, yeah, of course, of course. But still, enough about all that. Let's get to the particulars. Yuri Ohara, 5 feet 11 inches tall, 145.1 pounds, age 29, born November the 2nd, 1990, so he's a full two years older than me. Representing the Kiba Martial Arts Club and fighting out of Shibuya Endo, Tokyo, Japan. He has a professional mixed martial arts record of 26 wins, 18 losses, 3 draws, and 1 no contest. And is a former deep lightweight title challenger who's currently riding who's currently riding a stretch of two and three in his last five. Two of those three losses for the deep lightweight title were to Koji Takeda. And as for Yusuke Yachi, 
He's 21 and 10 overall. 5'9, last weighed in at 156.2 pounds. This fight will be contested at 71 kgs or 157 pounds. He's 30 years old, born May 13, 1990, in Bunkyo, Tokyo, Japan, representing the Crazy B. Representing the Crazy Bee Academy, formerly ran by the late great Naughty Fumi Kid Yamamoto, may he rest in peace. But also, prior to this fight and prior to a few of his most recent fights, he spent time at Henry Hoop Sanford MMA in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, USA. However, since he's joined the Rising roster back in no, back in December of 2016, it's been all. A bit of a mystery, so to speak. Ever since he got on that five fight KO streak or five fight finishing streak, even though four of his five fights were finishes, he's gone four he's gone one and four since then under rising rules. His only win was a soccer kick knockout inside the Bellator cage at Bellator 237, knocking out Hiroto Uesako. But obviously getting Shit canned, I guess. Losing via knockout to Luis Gustavo. Losing via eye cut to Johnny Hollywood Case. Losing via decision to Mikuru Asakura. And obviously getting knocked the fuck out by Roberto Satoshi de Sosa <coughs> back at Ryzen 22 on August 9th. So all in all, his Ryzen record is 6-4. and four. Whereas O'Hara is making his... Rising debut after fighting in deep for so long, so I got to ask, do y'all think that Yachi will be able to bounce back like a snapback and get back on the winning track, or do you think that O'Harver is just going to be too much for him? What do you think, Drake? Is this the return of Yachi, or is it... Or is he going to soon be going back to the uh, to deep on regionals if he loses this? What do you think? I mean, it absolutely has to be right. He needs this win terribly bad. It's it's kind of it's really sad to see this fall from grace for Yachi because man, he was on fire to start, you know, in Ryzen. And uh, he's been one of the most exciting guys, especially at lightweight. You know, in, in all of Ryzen, I would say he's, I think he's very fun to watch. Um, but yeah, man, complete back against the wall here. It's like if he loses this one. I, I don't know what you do with them afterwards. Um, and, you know, it's always a good motivation. I've, I feel like I've been talking about this a lot lately, just on my other podcast um, that I do, uh, just with fighters who are back against the wall, like three fight losing streaks or whatever it may be. When they're in that position, they'll come and shine, you know, better than they have in a long time, or if not ever, because they really need to, because this is something where you can need to save your job kind of situation. Um, so he should be he should be able to do that here. It's just a matter of, Man, I know you expect him to be a little bit more competitive against some of these guys, but then, you know, Roberto de Souza, he's obviously incredibly talented, so maybe that one's a bit of an exception, but, you know, you, I thought he would have lasted a bit longer than that, you know, it's one of those things, so, um, well, I think he can rise to the occasion, and he needs to rise to the occasion. Counterpoint to your, uh, to your point about back against the wall. This past week, we just saw Covington versus Woodley. Mm-hmm. Woodley's back with yeah. against the wall. And it was probably, literally, yeah, literally, literally, literally for the entire fight. He threw, I think, was it stat that he only threw four punches, something like that? Or there was some insane stat where, like, in, in one round where he threw four punches or something like yeah. that. But nonetheless, my point is, even when there's fighters who whose backs are against the wall, literally, metaphorically, sometimes <laughs> they just. It's like their mind is out of it. We also saw that with Rashad Evans near the end of his career, where he just, his, he just mentally, the mental aspect of fighting was just not there anymore. And I don't know if it's because, because they are just getting old, they're losing a pep in their step, or the losses got to them. I mean, I, and here's the thing, uh, Crazy B camp has not been very successful pretty recently in Ryzen, minus Miyamoto yeah. and, uh, and Aishimizu. A lot of their fighters have gone down in, in pretty bad fights, including Ersan at Ryzen 22. Um, I mean, I, I know that, that you, I think you said it best, that he, that he should take it like his back is against the wall, literally. But it's just, I don't know. 
I don't know. Here's the thing. They match him up against Ohara. Who, if you ever seen Ohara, first of all, he hasn't aged. I was watching some of his fights uh, from like 2008, uh, early deep, and he hasn't aged since then. But here's the thing. He's a small lightweight. Uh, he is a tall, lanky guy, and Yachi is much bigger. Mm. This is a fight that Yachi should win, but I'm not even 100% confident that he can win, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, very well said, man. I mean, he, he is very, it's funny, he's 5'11", right? But, yeah, the size in terms of, I mean, Yauchi's a thick dude for lightweight and everything. Oh, um, yeah. should be Should be able to, you know, muscle him around if he so chooses, but that's not usually Yauchi's game. Um, yeah, it'll be really interesting to see how it unfolds. You know, he can't, it's one of those things where he can't get too comfortable because if he does, he could definitely, you know, get caught by something. I mean, O'Hara's got that crazy up kick in his last fight as well. I mean, oh, he's dangerous awesome. in a, a lot of places. So, it's kind man, of... I would be, that would probably be the saddest way Yachi could oh, lose man. if he lost by that exact same up kick, kind of like, almost like uh, Musashi did to uh, Shakurai yeah, yeah, yeah. uh, in Japan as well. It would be it would it would be the kibosh on his career, and I don't know what you would do with him after that. It's because clearly Ryzen wanted him to be their lightweight kid. Oh, I mean, they wanted him to be their version of Kid Yamamoto. They wanted they were going to clearly do big stuff for him. But it just never worked out. It never worked out, unfortunately. Actually, here's the other thing as well. This fight has no elbows as well. Do you think that will be a factor, Drake, in this uh, being the only MMA match that's not allowing elbows? Um, I don't. Th- I don't think it should be too big of a factor. I mean, I can't really, off the top of my head here, as I think about, it, I don't remember Yauchi utilizing elbows too much. It doesn't seem like one of his big weapons, you know, maybe on the ground a little bit, but even then, it um, doesn't seem like something he throws too often. And as for O'Hara, I'm not too sure about that either, but I don't, I don't think it should be much of a factor. You know, they'll probably strike from range for the most part. I don't know. There's so many different options to where this fight could play out, I think, which is what makes it interesting, especially with the outside factors of, you know, Yauchi needing this win and how if he'll be more serious than ever because of that. Mm-hmm. Well, here's the thing also, Drake. We also do official picks as well. Okay. So I'm officially going to, you know, say, you know what? I'm going to agree with you. I think Yachi's going to – I think Yachi will hopefully take this mm-hmm. fight seriously and he will realize, you know – my job could potentially be on the line. My star power could be on the could be on the line. I'm going from the main event to the curtain jerker match. <laughs> I hope he realizes that that let's, it's kind of like when you arrive a favor in UFC was going from the from the pay per view cards to the to the fight pass or TV card. It's kind of like that where you just it's pulled them all the way down and like you're basically you're opening the card and that should be a signal. I'm gonna say Yachi. <laughs> this will be Yachi's comeback. What about you, Drake? And then we'll go to you, Christian. What do you think, Drake? Do you think Yachi will win this? Yeah, I believe in Yachi. I think that he, he'll he rise to the occasion here. You know, he'll get a pretty sweet highlight reel knock. And I have faith in him, you know. Um, last resort, why not have some faith in the guy? I'll say, let's get specific here. I'll I'll say round two knockout for Yachi. Oh, damn. Round two knockout. How about you, Christian? Give us your thoughts. Yachi versus Ohara. Before I give my thoughts, the thoughts of the topology faithful says that 85% want to see Yachi get the win over O'Hara. With that being said, I don't know, because when you think about Yachi, his back really is up against the rope, so to speak. Literally and figuratively, of course. He's <laughs> fighting in a ring for like the last 10 fights. But oh, that was better. We should have said that. You should have said that, Drake. Uh, his back is against the ropes. <laughs> that's true. He was against the cage in his win, his recent win. <laughs> uh, that's true. That's okay. I'll, 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 uh, I'll, 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 I'll ten points for Gryffindor. Yeah, of course, of course. But still, point of the matter is, it's like y'all said, Yachi has to win this fight. He has to win this. Otherwise, what good is his career gonna be? If he continues to take L's, he's just going to be as worthless as King Reyna missing weight. Which, oh, by the way, that's a story in and of itself. Not to worry for a later time, but still. Point of the matter is, I think Yachi will get the win in this one. I think it might be via late round knockout. But it's, it's, let's just say... If he doesn't isolate, if Yachi doesn't isolate O'Hara early, I think that's when he's going to start getting into trouble because, you know, 
Ohara, oh. we don't know much about him other than his deep career. So I think it should only be... I mean, I think that Yachi should get the win if he isolates Ohara early and often. If not, I'll it say this. Be a the best advice I can give for you. Sorry, could you go ahead? I'm saying, if, if, if Yachi doesn't isolate Ohara early and often, it's going to be a bad night for him. Yeah, best advice for Yachi. Avoid the up kick, tie your hair back. Don't want to get in your face. <laughs> That would be good, I, good advice. And, you know, providing that that happens, listen, he should be able, he should, that's the thing, he should be able to win this match. We'll yeah, we, see. we've seen it, yeah. Oh, yeah, we've seen it. But we've, you know, it's, it, there's always, uh, MMA, you know, MMA, yeah. after, we've always <laughs> seen, you know, the fighters who could be, I mean, I, I, I mean, it, it's, it, he should win this match. If he doesn't, it'll be not surprising the least. I, I'll be more. I'll be more surprised if he wins at this point. But I'm, I'm still picking it because he, he'll have the size advantage, and he should also just have the athletic advantage, um, mm. MMA wise. Um, now, this next fight, Chris, you want me to take it over since I have the kickboxing stats? Go right ahead. I mean, you and probably the- know more about this fight than I do at this point. Oh yeah, because I'm I'm a nerd and I have no time. And so like, what I do is I just I look up random prelim despising <laughs> kickboxing fights. Uh, anyway, uh, we got Yuki Kitagawa taking on Taishi Hiratsuka. Uh, Kitagawa is from the Aries Gym. He's mostly a shoot boxer. Uh, has done some kickboxing matches. While Hiratsuka is from Team Dragon. Um, and um, here's some stats I have from the Ryzen. Uh, I guess you could call them the little uh, placards that they release in English uh, and in Japanese when they give the, the data of the fighters. Kitagawa, 11 wins, 7 losses, 5 KOs. Hiratsuka, 12 wins, 7 KOs, 6 losses. Uh, Kitagawa is 5'9", 30 years old. Hiratsuka, 5'9", 27 uh, years old. So, 3 years younger than uh, Kitagawa. Um... It's, uh, they also write, Kitagawa ut- utilizes his long reach to throw bombs from the outside. Hirosuka uses his crisp striking to throw kicks from the outside. Both fighters aren't afraid to exchange, which makes their guards low and open their strikes. Both fighters will strike and will not back down. Um, yeah, and uh, also Hirosuka never fought kickboxing, uh, not kickboxing, shootboxing, uh, and has fought for rise, deep, uh, and crush. Um Basically, what this is going to come down to is is a guy who's who's a shoot boxer going to use those hard kicks, uh, Kitagawa, or is Hiratsuka going to overwhelm the uh, t- uh, not taller but lankier? And here's saying Kitagawa is a lankier guy, a lanky guy for five for nine. Uh, Drake, um, I don't know if you had, you had much time to to really ascertain both of these fighters. Uh, do you have a thought on this match or anything at all that you want to contribute? Uh, more so on Hiratsuka, of course. I really like, you know, his kicking game. He mixes up his kicks very well. They're very quick. I think that they're, you know, probably he's got quicker leg kicks or kick speed than his punch speed, actually, which is something I feel like you don't see very often unless, you know, that's just a weird take that I'm having. But uh, that's my biggest note on him. I uh, don't too, know too much about Kitagawa, but, um, yeah, that's that's obviously my thing to look forward, look at um, in terms of this matchup. Uh, the other thing about Hirosuka is that um, he tends to, I don't know if it's a strategy or if it's something he doesn't even realize this far into his kickboxing career, he gets tagged a lot. And it has yeah, led to yeah. him, uh, in some cases, losing some fights or getting knocked down. Um, so I do not know if that is a strategy, but I would not recommend that strategy against Kitagawa. The one, the one, uh, here's the other thing as well. I will say though, Kitagawa in the one fight I did see of his, he got tired after the second round. He was sweating, he was huffing and puffing, and then that, that fight also went, uh, to extension. So by the fourth round, he was just, uh, he was just like, Literally just melting, uh, melting sweat. So um, this is a tough one to pick, but, um, you know, uh, usually I would go for the lankier guy in a kickboxing match, but he's also more of a shoot boxer. He's not going to be able to do those takedowns or anything like that and presumably get game points that way or knock out that way. Um, I tend to veer towards someone who's more 
in the kickboxing realm, to, in the kickboxing fight, I would have got to go off here at Suka. Um, any thoughts, Drake? Uh, you know, I don't like to give official predictions if I don't know one of the fighters, but okay. yeah, <laughs> since I do know of Hiratsuka, I obviously have to go with him. Um, I won't give a specific uh, type of, you know, how we'll finish it, but yeah, I'll, I'll give him, I'll go for him. Uh, Christian, uh, what's the best, uh, best, uh, thing you can offer about this fight? Any thoughts? Anything? Hmm. The only thing I can say... I don't know about any predictions, because I don't know jack and crap about either of these two fighters. But I can only say this. If this fight becomes as good as the main event will be, then I think a lot of people will take notice in these two competitors. Other than that, oh, yeah. I am completely undecided on who's going to win this fight. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Uh, you know, hopefully, you know, a lot of these kickboxing fights can either be hit or miss. Like, they're either really exciting or really boring. They tend to never be in, in between. Hopefully, it's a really exciting fight between two two of these these two. But enough about that fight. We got to talk about the real main event of this card. Christian, <laughs> take it take it for fight number three. We must talk about the heavyweight match yes. between two debuts. The open, Here we go. <laughs> the open weight match, not the heavyweights, the open weights. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, yeah. This is contested at 265 pounds or 120 kilos, and both of these men are new to the game in MMA, but they come with extensive backgrounds and a whole shit ton of controversy. <laughs> it's Dylan James, a.k.a. James Radine, versus Suyoshi Sudario, a.k.a. Takano Fuji Sanzo. Here's the particulars. Dylan James, born May 25th, 1991 in Auckland, New Zealand. He stands in at 6 feet 5 inches tall and weighs in at 253 pounds. He made his professional wrestling debut... For zero one, well, actually, he made his professional wrestling debut in New Zealand for a promotion called IPW back in February of 2010. No, wait, actually, back in August of 2009. So he's actually been in the ring for 11 years. He came to the U.S., got trained by the greatest pro wrestling tag team of all time in the Dudley Boys, a.k.a. Team 3D, Bubba Ray and Devon, and also trained by Alfred Valentine in his initial training, and gone on to become one of the top professional wrestlers in the world. He headlined one of the first style battle events for WWN. He became a one-time All-Japan World Tag Team Champion. He became a one-time World's Strongest Tag League Determination winner with Joe Dunninger. And in Zero One Wrestling, he was the Furukazen Tournament winner with Zeus, the Fire Festival Tournament winner in 2013, a one-time Zero One Heavyweight Champ, a one-time NWA United National Heavyweight Champ, and a one-time Intercontinental Tag Team Champ with ECW veteran Masato Tanaka. <laughs> See how I'm marked out for that? <laughs> also, also, James has a bit of a backstory about him. Once upon a time, as a matter of fact, I think, I don't know if this was more recently, but he was caught trying to kidnap a young woman and send her back to New Zealand with him under the disgust of her parents. So he changed his name up to avoid getting into any yellow tape with the Japanese government because he was a wanted man and obviously his last and most recent professional wrestling match according to cage match was back on August the 28th at Southern Honor Wrestling in Canton Georgia where he was a part of a Rumble Jack match which of course he lost <laughs> but this will be his first Japanese combat sports appearance since Tokyo Championship Wrestling back on February 19th in which he was a part of a three-way dance for the IPW US Tag Team title so I mean don't ask me how I know all this stuff I'm just crazy <laughs> about professional wrestling <laughs> in the meantime
time, his opponent is not a professional wrestler, but a sumo star. <laughs> Takano Fuji Sanzo, a.k.a. Suyoshi Sudalio. Six feet three inches tall. He weighed in previously at 346 pounds or 157 kilos, but is looking to drop down to meet that 265 pound, 120 kilogram requirement. He has a sumo record of 165 wins, 112 losses, and 28 draws throughout his sumo career, which lasted from March 2013 to October 2019, where he ranked as high as a Jurio Do sumo wrestler, Jurio 5 sumo wrestler, before retiring due to, you know, complications of smoking weed, I guess. Well, actually, no, no, Christian, 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 no, no, he, he slapped his, uh, he slapped an attendant, oh, allegedly. Right, 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 he slapped an attendant, and didn't come back into the world of combat sports until just this year, after not doing anything for almost a year just to, you know, set himself straight, so to speak. But aside from that, at the Ryzen 24 press conference, James Radin was talking a whole lot of hot shit because of the fact that he was basically bashing sumo wrestlers while saying that he had legendary mixed martial arts and kickboxing failure slash champion sumo and professional wrestler Chad Rowan, a.k.a. Akebono Toro, in his corner. We, myself and Andrew, recently spoke to Sidario and... His trainer, the legendary Yamato Damashi, Ensign Inoue, and he basically said via Ensign that he was going to kick his ass. <laughs> so, this fight has all the capabilities of erupting like a volcano, but I have to ask, who do you think has the advantage in this crazy contest of debutantes, the sumo wrestler or the actual pure wrestle guy? Drake, all yours. Go for it. <laughs> the fans have the advantage. <laughs> no, oh, no. I, hey, uh, by the way, need I mention this fight to avoid either one of these two men being exhausted is scheduled for three three minute rounds with elbows to the head allowed. Jeez, yeah. Um, I don't know. It's one of the, it's one of those fights, right? It's one one of those in quotation marks. We couldn't find we couldn't bring Bob Sapp back, so this is what we get. <laughs> um, um, I I don't know. I I I guess I lean towards Sudario. I, I believe in that sumo wrestling. <laughs> you know, um, I, it's it's. I don't have a lot of thought on it besides well, it is know, it is what it is, right? <laughs> Do you think internationally, Drake, this fight will get, like, when it gets posted on r slash MMA, you think the streaming bowl will be higher than uh, whatever happens in the tension fights? Um, I or think it kind of depends on what happens. I mean, obviously these aren't, you know, notable guys in, in regards to, you know, crazy open weight fights or freak show fights, whatever you want to call it. Um, and I mean... It, it, it's tension. I mean, I think that he should probably still be the the bigger story out of there, the most viewed thing out of this, you know. So <laughs> we'll see. But you never know with these fights. <laughs> well, for this, do you can can this? Do you think this could possibly go like how the Osuna Rashi, uh, Bob Sapp fights went, where after the first round they're just both exhausted. And they're just oh now here's the thing. We did talk to Inoue and uh, Sudario. He said that his cardio is good. So, listen, I, I won't doubt him of that, but, you know, there's this between training, you know, going to, going to dojo and, and running, you know, your, your, your camps, and then when you get into the ring, and all that. Do you think, potentially, that this can just, if this doesn't end by the first round, are we in for a long night? Of course, but I fucking hope not, man. <laughs> I really hope not. That was the worst fight I've ever seen, maybe. <laughs> but, um, you know, I know some people loved it for that entertainment value, which is totally fair. But, um, yeah, I mean, of course, that's a possibility, and that's why we're doing a nine-minute fight here <laughs> at most. So, yeah, that's absolutely possible. <laughs> also, well, here's the thing. Uh, what I'm most curious about is, okay, so Dylan James said that he has – that Akibono was a senpai. This can't be recent. Akibono is in the hospital, or at least was in the hospital very recently. So I have no idea. This must have been when, 
when Aki Bono was either in All Japan or Zero One when these two came into contact. Because that's the only way. I cannot believe that Aki Bono, when he said, when he said that Aki Bono was a senpai, that he was, Aki Bono was training him for this fight. Because that's not physically possible. Um, I have no idea where Dan- Dylan James is training. Like, I have not been able to find anything on that. Uh, yeah, for those that didn't see the press conference as well, did you see the press conference, uh, Drake? I did not. Okay. The there was some guy behind him, and I call him, I call him Orange, Orange Jacket Sonny Ono, because he reminded so... There was this, there was this Japanese guy who was dressed in an orange or red suit who was talking... Who was like it was like a heel manager from the '90s who was talking for Dylan James, and I, I don't know like if this is his man, if his legit manager, or if he just hired one of his pro wrestling buddies to talk for him, or if this guy's yeah. in his training camp. I, I I don't know what it, it it felt. It almost felt like I was watching like a pro wrestling angle, and I turned on. I didn't turn on Ryzen. This whole thing. It was, I, I turned on like New Japan or WWE or something. Um, I won't lie though, Dylan James's trash talk really did get me into the building when he said, you know, uh, you like to punch out attendance and you like to punch out the whatever, I'm going to punch you out, you know, teach you a lesson. So I do not say this in, in saying that I think that Dylan James is a better fighter I, or, or better whatever at this point. Yeah. But I think that Dylan James will win this fight by knockout. He talked me into the building, and he t- and he convinced me in his in his one little wrestling promo he's going to win. Christian, <laughs> well, actually, well, Drake, well, do you think that you you have to? Uh, I'm guessing you're, you're Sidario. You think Sidario is going to take this, right? Well, he's a faithful are saying sixty six percent. Surprisingly, they want to see the sumo wrestler get the win over the professional wrestler. But okay. here's the thing. I think Dylan James has been watching way too many old school Dusty Rhodes promos trying to talk asses into seats. I mean, I think Dylan James is probably digging way too much into the old book of kayfabe, so to speak. Even though, his, even though many people don't know that, I mean, and I'm guessing you know about this by now, Drake. M- Japanese MMA is more storyline based. Yeah. I mean, basically, Dylan James is saying, you know, I got Akimoto Taro with me. I got him helping me out when really he's been inactive for about two years now due to this coma thing. And he's probably lost a considerable amount of weight because of it. So I don't think. Yeah, well, here's the thing. I've been following Dylan James on his Instagram. I see nothing of him posting like training photos or training videos. That's what you always do whenever you're training for a fight. You're always that's what you always do. You always post something. He's posted nothing. I'm not even sure if he even has a camp. Maybe he's still training. <laughs> I'm I not really, even training at all. <laughs> yeah, that's the, I don't know. Like, cause, cause, look, I'll go to his Instagram right now. Dylan James. I follow him. Uh, Dylan James athlete. Uh. And his most recent one is of the poster of him and Sidario. The only photos of he has are of him. Looks like he's losing a little bit of, of weight, or just you know cutting a little bit of weight. Other than that, I see no training. Just well, I just see him at the gym. That's all I'm seeing. Which that doesn't help for an MMA fight. But nonetheless, I'm still sticking with my pick. Sorry, Christian. Go back to you, um, <laughs> Sidario or James. What I'm to say is. We've seen pro wrestlers fight in Japan in mixed martial arts, and some of them have had good results, like a Bob Sapp, for instance. Some of them have just been completely embarrassing, like the late Dr. Depp Steve Williams or Mike Gun. I mean, Mike Barton, aka Bart Gun. <laughs> or just a recent memory, Lady Tapa and Jazzy Gabbard, aka Alpha Female. Or, you know, running off the ropes and getting your ass handed to you like Yuki Kohota. <laughs> I still can't believe that. I yeah, still can't all believe that. Yeah, ass whooping scars just can't be wrong. Still. The point of the matter is, I think I'm going to go ahead and pick the sumo wrestler over the pro wrestler, Sudario over James Radine. But... Here's the thing. 
this can either be really good or so bad that it's good like the Osuna Rashi Kentaro Bob Sap fight. I just hope that a lot of people when they end up seeing this fight, they don't they either don't immediately shit can it and say, Oh, this was a bad fight, these two men have shitty cardio and all that. I just hope that this fight actually excites people to want to be interested in seeing more big guys in MMA because of course the heavyweight division outside the UFC I know the heavyweight or openweight division outside the main three promotions UFC Bellator 1FC is getting kind of dry we need something to wet the palate we need something to hype things up and I think this fight as crazy as it may seem as Carney, as it may seem, I think this might just whet a lot of people's appetites. Oh, uh, yeah, Drake, uh, going back to you, sorry, did you make it, do you want to make an official pick? I think that's a better question to ask. <laughs> yeah, I'll, uh, I'll take the draw on this one. No, no, I'll do, I'll do this scenario by, uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to say decision, I'm afraid it's going to suck. <laughs> Listen, oh, listen, I, listen, I, I'm picking James. You know what? This is now interesting. We'll see. Who knows? Maybe it'll be the best. This will end in a 10-second knockout, and it'll, it'll go on ESPN highlights or whatever. Uh, yeah, uh, something it'll, definitely be, it'll definitely be worth the Sports Center top 10 moment. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I would, I, it would be so funny if the amount of time we talked about this fight is, is, is longer than the actual fight. Yep, we'll have yep. to wait and see. Um, I am I am anticipating though. It is the one fight that you're kind of like you don't know what's going to happen. So I can at least I at least admire Ryzen for putting in something a little bit different that the other two cards, uh, twenty two and twenty three didn't have. You know they kind of had just they had you know MMA matches and kickboxing matches that were for the most part equal. Uh, they, they, they weren't they weren't so like they, this one like is the one that that like catches your eye. If you're showing the card to anybody who's not a fan, and I think is the one that that could get people most interested uh, in the show um, that are not regular Ryzen or JMMA fans. Um, with that being said, Christian, you want to take on the next three fights to read the particulars, and we'll talk about the fights uh, one by one. Oh yes, let's go ahead and talk about the fights particular by particular, one by one. First off. A lightweight, I mean, first off, a featherweight bout at 66 kilos, 143 pounds. Takahiro Ashida versus the underground emperor, Kyohei Hakiwara. Ashida, 5'8", 146.1 pounds, age 31, born August the 29th, 1989, representing Bray Jim, originally born in Koshigaya, Saitama, Japan, Fighting out of Bray Jim in do 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 do. Hold on, give me a second, give me a second. Fighting out of Bray Jim in. Where is it? Tokyo, right? Yeah, Misato, Tokyo, Japan. <clears throat> he has a record of 23 wins, 10 losses, and 2 draws. And most recently fought on the Bellator 237 post slim card in a Ryzen Rules kickboxing bout. Against former K1 star Ren Hiramoto, in which he got knocked out. He is the former deep featherweight champion and a former PXC lightweight title challenger. May that promotion rest in peace. He's also fought for Grand Slam, Arzalet Fighting, Rebel FC, Grodshawn, Rings the Outsider, and of course, Bellator by way of Ryzen. As for his opponent, Kyohei Hagiwara, whose official record, according to him, is 3-2, 5-10, 145 pounds, age 24, born December 28, 1995, representing Team Smoker, fighting out of Osaka, Japan. His most recent Ryzen appearance was a knockout over Dark Rikuto Shirakawa back at Ryzen 22 in the third round, back on August the 9th. So I'm pretty sure that fight will be exciting. And the Tapology Faithful have that. An outstanding 88% for Ashida. In the second fight we're supposed to be talking about, it's Reina Kubota making her return to the Rising Ring against former Deep Jewels strawweight or lightweight champion Emi Tomimasu. 
first of all, the particulars for the woman who has a sister who's a damn good guitarist in Emmy Tomiyasu. She has a professional MMA record of 15 wins and 16 losses and is currently riding a two-fight win streak. She's 5 feet 1 inches tall, 104.9 pounds. Age 38, born in Kawasaki, Kanagawa, Japan on April 13, 1982, representing Perez de Machudo in the stylings of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, fighting out of Funabashi, Chiba, Japan. This will be her rising debut, and she's currently riding a streak of 2-3 and three in her last five. 2-4 and four if you want to count her grappling bout against Elvira Karpinen at Quintet Fight Night 3. She, again, is a former Deep Jewels Animate title challenger and a former Deep Jewels lightweight champion, which is now strawweight. Her opponent, the shoot boxing goddess Reina Kubota, who is 10-3 overall in mixed martial arts. 5'3", 111.7 pounds with a 63-inch reach. Age 29, born in Osaka, Japan on June 29, 1991. Representing Sista Takeshi Jim in the style of shoot boxing which she's excelled very well in fighting out of Konohana, Osaka, Japan. She has fought almost the entirety of her professional MMA career, save for one bout in shoot boxing and one bout in Bellator for the Rising Fighting Federation. She is currently riding a two fight winning streak, knocking out Neophyte or complete nobody Alexandra Alvare in 20 seconds back on back on October 12th at Ryzen 19, and defeating Lindsey Van Zandt in the rematch of their Bellator MMA bout back on New Year's Eve via throwing the towel. Automatic TKO. <laughs> but still, this fight's going to probably be a blowout, and the tapology fate for proving that so as Emi Tomimasu basically has no chance in hell. <laughs> basically, Kubota has a 98% chance of winning this bout. And the third and final fight on the car that we're going to be talking about concurrently is Yuta Kentaro Hokamuna versus Kenta Takizawa, a bout that was just made as of the date of this recording this morning, September 21st, 2020. So, this fight, this fight's going to probably be something epic. Unfortunately, no tapology score had no tapology scores available for this fight because they're too damn lazy to get their shit together and put this fight on their. Car. I was so I was so bizarre when I saw it. It was like literally the week of, and I'm like, why did this fight take so long? Was like Kintar demanding so much money? They probably like, had I was, it, to be honest, they probably had it under wraps. Hokamula. <laughs> 13, 8, and 2 overall. 5'6", 135.7 pounds, 27 years of age. Born March 19, 1993. Representing P's Lab Osaka slash Pancrase Inagaki Gumi. Fighting out of Osaka. He is coming back into the fold for Ryzen following a rear naked choke submission victory over Kenji Kato at Ryzen 21 back on February the 22nd the last rising fight card to have a full-blown fight crowd. And of course, he is a former Bantamweight King of Pancrase title challenger and a star for Rings the Outsider as an amateur. His opponent, another Pancrase veteran, Kenta Takizawa. 5'9", and a quarter pounds, age 25, born November the 16th, 1994. Representing Reversal Gym Tokyo Standout and fighting out of Tokyo, Japan. This will be his this will be his rising debut after fighting nearly the entirety of his professional MMA career since his two early fights for Pan Clays. And of course, if the Tapology Faithful were voting for this, it would probably be 50-50, but who the hell are we to know? First of all, I mean all I gotta ask is, what are your thoughts about each of these three fights, respectively? And even though this is basically the mid card, do you see any surprises that might shock your interest? Yeah, that Drake, I have to um, uh, give us all your thoughts. 
So, yeah, I like this nice stretch here. You know, Ashida versus Hagiwara is an interesting one in terms of, you know, MMA experience. It is a, it very heavily in favor of Ashida, obviously, hearing their records there and all that. But I think it should be a pretty fun fight and competitive fight for the most part. Hagiwara, a very fun performance in his last uh, victory. That was at was at the twenty two, yeah, Rising twenty two. Yeah. Um, good win there. Come, but, behind, you know, come from behind victory if you uh, uh if you think about it, because he was losing that fight up until really third round. Yeah, very true. And he just started piecing him up late. So definitely a good showing there. Um, if you guys missed that listening, go check that out. Uh, and then of course, you know, for me personally, Reina and Emmy. It's probably out of these three. This is the most interesting one. I would be more interested in it if this was the Tomimatsu of maybe a couple years ago, but for yeah. Rana, this is her, you know, most experienced opponent that she's ever fought in MMA, which is a very interesting thing to note, and, you know, she's very durable, very tough, total veteran and all that, but, yeah, you know, just has not been a very dangerous fighter, you know, in terms of finishing opponents throughout her entire career, um, and she's never been knocked out, actually, in her career, which is pretty... I know! I saw but, that! I saw, I saw her loss, like, zero knockouts! Yeah, yeah. yeah. Until now. <laughs> so, <you> know, so, <laughs> that happened eventually. Um, you know, she's like, what, 37 now, I believe. Um, obviously, somewhat of a pioneer, you could say, definitely within the women's divisions in Japan. Yeah. And um, a little bit surprising, too, that Ryzen hasn't had her fight for them sooner. Of course, they don't have like a legit strawweight division or anything, which is probably the reason why. But I would have thought that they would have matched her up with you know, somebody sooner than this. But um, yeah, I think it'll be interesting to see um, how long she can last against Reyna. I, I just expect Reyna will be able to do whatever she wants on the feed. You know, Emmy gets hit a lot. Like I said, she is durable and can take some damage, but I think that the power and, you know, striking ability that Reyna has is going to just be too much over time. Maybe not a clean knockout, but she'll break her down. I'll say that'll be a round two knockout just to give the, the prediction for that one for Reyna. Um, and then Kintaro and Kenta, that one is very interesting as well. And I want to focus on something for this one because Kintaro in his last fight, you know, a very good win as well when he got that rear naked choke. His top pressure was excellent, you know, just like glue on his opponent and ended up getting the uh, rear naked with, uh, you know, finding the opening as they were transitioning there. Very nice stuff there. Put him to sleep. Um, Kintaro, you know, he was wearing shoes in that fight, so I'm curious to see if he wants to play with the shoes in this one now with the new rule, which we didn't really talk about too much when I mentioned it, but we can get into it here. Um, just, you know, what are your guys' thoughts on that, of course, because that is something that people are very, uh, <laughs> opinions were mixed when Shingo I mean, announced that. It's, it's a strange, it's really strange. And so basically, well, there is, so basically, it's basically, don't wear shoes. If they're saying, yeah. oh, you can't do anything on the ground, why were you? well, here's the thing. Initially, I thought you couldn't do anything on the ground. I thought you couldn't do soccer kicks at most mm -hmm. when you had shoes on. And I just kind of figured that would make sense. But now, it's now, now we have, like, officially in writing from Shingo, oh, no, riser rules now. If you wear shoes, you cannot knee or kick. Then what the fuck? Can, just don't, <laughs> if, if half of your, if, 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 like, if half of your offense, our ground offense will be taken away, there's no, there's, there's no, there's, really, there's really no advantage to having it. I mean, well, here's the thing. I, I know that Manel Cape, uh, he said he, he was wearing shoes because after I think it was a Horiguchi fight, well, actually during the Horiguchi fight, he was slipping a lot, and he said after that fight, he started wearing shoes, which would help uh, prevent the uh, slipping. So I guess if you're somebody who's I don't know. Maybe if you're later on the card, maybe it would be an advantage because, you know, if they're, if they're presumed, well, I don't know, they're probably cleaning that ring much more now than they were pre-pandemic. Yeah. So, I guess, I mean, if you're worried about, if you're a slipper, then yeah, maybe, but in terms of like, someone like Kintaro or Akai is a curl, well, I know Akai doesn't wear shoes, but like, if, if, you, if you're a guy who's known for your, for your striking on the ground, or like even, let's say Reyna, you know, we've seen Reyna do, uh, uh, very much ground offense. Yeah, there's no point to wearing them because you just you're basically not gonna be able to do anything. Christian, I think you gotta feel the same way, right? Oh yeah, I gotta feel the same way because basically what Ryzen's trying to do is if you're wearing shoes, you're only gonna be limited to doing punches. You're gonna be limited to doing punches, elbows, and grappling. Basically, yeah, you're going to be fighting like you're a boxer slash jujitsu jiu player, I guess. Well, I have to think about this. In the Yachi O'Hara fight, there's no elbow. So imagine if one of the fighters wears shoes. 
You're not going to be able to do all these punches now. <laughs> That's even worse. That is a hilarious thought. It's going to feel like one of those bare knuckle boxing fights. Yeah, it, it, it doesn't rise its way of wanting their fighters to not wear shoes. Then they should just say, "Oh no, we're not allowing shoes anymore." I think that I think this is one of those things where it's like they're, it seems like they're really overthinking something that should just simply be stated much more simply if they want it to go in that direction. You know, we know for for kickboxing matches, no elbows allowed except for that one uh, one they just had at Rise of Twenty Two, which they allowed elbows, but it was clearly written elbows allowed. So I just think it's a really it's a really strange rule. Drake, what do you think? It's a it just seems it seems overcomplicated. They're overcomplicating something that's really simple. So I will give you guys a little bit of a mini spoiler here for Broaden Horizon episode two. Um, cheap plug for that, you know, but we, we did get into this and talk about it somewhat in depth and give some more explanations. Um, you know, cause at the end of the show, Shingo and I kind of, you know, shoot the shit just about, you know, whatever we just heard from the fighters and whatever topics and whatnot. So yeah, we obviously talked about the shoe rule. And for me, when I heard this, I was kind of like, okay, well, the knees doesn't really make any sense to me because yeah. obviously, you know, it's it's more about the shoe and the foot part. But he said, you know, it was more of an issue where it will create a gray area and there will be he, – he would expect more controversies from, you know, the officials being like, let's say, for example, somebody throws the knee and then – let's say it's a knee to the head or whatever, and then the shoe comes up and the shoe makes contact with, you know, the stomach or something like that, and they'll be like, oh, well, he used the foot as well. Like, make there be an argument for that is what his explanation was behind it. And, you know, I get that, that it would create unnecessary controversy, so just cancel out the whole limb. But so essentially the thing is, yeah, just don't wear shoes if you want to, if you want to avoid all that, of course. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, it, it from what it sounds like, it was more of a, a commission kind of thing, trying to want to try out new things without fully getting oh, rid of something, oh, oh. you know? You know what this so, sounds like? Do you remember what, uh, this sounds like the whole kerfuffle that happened with the Wyman Musashi fight. Do you remember that fight? Yeah, that yeah. Before? And like that whole knee to the head and Wyman had one arm or one hand on the ground. Yeah. But apparently they adopted the one arm, one hand on the ground rule is allowable. You can still allow knees to the head. It, it just, it just seems like it's, uh, yeah. Oh God! This is what happens when commissions try new things. It never—it's always becomes. A, just think of the rules that you either have now, or just—I don't know. Just a lot of no shoes. Essentially, just don't wear the shoes. <laughs> exactly. There's no, there's no point, especially if you're in the first fight. I swear to God, Ohara Yashi comes down with shoes. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna do the Picard uh, hand in my. Uh, Here we go. Uh, uh, Picard. Uh, uh, disappointment meme or whatever, because it's just gonna be like, dude, you didn't read the fucking rules. <laughs> <laughs> um, but going back to Kintaro Takazawa, um, Drake, uh, you were talking about Kintaro before. You know, yeah, you said he was wearing shoes for this one. Um, I guess presuming he's smart and he doesn't wear the shoes. Mm -hmm. I guess you know. I mean, do you think the fight is this is a fight that probably does favor Kintaro almost in every way? I would say. Yeah, I, I would think so as well. Um, you know, I like what I've seen from him a lot more recently, but, you know, uh, Takazawa has proven to be, you know, pretty dangerous, has a diverse uh, highlight reel as well, got the jumping knee in his last fight. Oh, yeah. um, and, you know, he does have a, a, a pretty notable win on his record, you know, if we're comparing, like, names and all that, you know, the Louis Sanaduk, Santa, I always get the, his last name wrong, Sanu Dacus. <laughs> Louis Sanu Dacus is a great prospect from Canada. Obviously, that was four years ago, but, you know, being able to beat him, that shows that Takizawa is legit as well. Um, so, yeah, it's going to be interesting, but, yeah, Kentaro, I think he's just proven to be a little bit more consistently well-rounded in his skills. Obviously, his record is not the greatest record or anything, but in terms of this matchup, I think that things do play in his favor. Mm. Hey, Christian, uh, what are your thoughts on these three fights and predictions? Y'all haven't talked about the... Y'all haven't talked as much about the other two fights. I mean, what are your thoughts about the Reina Tomimasu fight? What are your thoughts about the Hagiwar Ashida fight? Oh. Oh, well, I mean, Drake, you just talked about them, kind of, mm -hmm. right? Um, yeah. I have to, okay. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll give my quick thoughts on, uh, uh, let's start, I'll start with Ashida Hagiwara. I, you know, definitely, you know, obviously, she, Ashida has much more experience, like, MMA, like, 
I think by by just sheer numbers. But I like I like Hagiwara. Hagiwara. There's something unique about him. There's something you know. I don't know. There's a little mysteriousness I like about him as, as a fighter. Uh, he's got that Yuki Matoya thing where it's just there's. I just he is he just has something that I'm attracted to in a fighter. Uh, I don't know if it's tattoos, and it's so rare to see a Japanese fighter with tattoos. <laughs> I'll actually be one of the few others who has a tattoos on his body. Um, but I think with that fight, you know, I, I you know, I have to favor Hockey Water just because I saw a guy who came back from losing and was able to win. I'm I'm I, when I see a fight, so, someone who could recognize what they're doing wrong in a fight admit, during a fight and then correct that, that tells me that that fighter is really smart. Um, Ishida's a great fighter, definitely well-rounded, but I don't know, can he, uh, well, if, if, if Hagiwara realizes what he's doing wrong in that fight and corrects it, will Ishida be able to adjust that? I don't know. I have to pick Hagiwara by that, and I think Hagiwara, I think, I think he wins this fight, he's, he's down for a long career horizon. Uh, quickly about Emmy, Reina Emmy. Listen, Emmy's one an unsung pioneer, you know, definitely up there with Megumi Fuji. I would put. Uh, would you agree, Jake? You know, in terms of Japanese or just women's MMA in general. Uh, yeah, I mean, she's definitely. I wouldn't say on the same level, of course, but definitely yeah. in terms of names and all that. Yeah, Emmy is one of those who's been around. What well, she started her career in? I want to say 2007. I have a record up here. Let's see, real quick. 2006, actually. So yeah, she's been fighting for you know about 15 years, roughly here. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would put her in that same that grouping pairing of you know obviously the Fujis in terms of names, obviously not skill level exactly, but you know uh, there's also she, Emmy Fujino. Example of a journey woman. She yeah, wins yes. a few and then loses a few. She li- she'll lose the big fights, but win the the smaller or B level fights. Um, and those are th- there's nothing wrong with that. Listen, not everybody is gonna is gonna beat the uh, the big players, but mm-hmm. she has carved a niche, and also she is great at grappling. That's the one advantage she'll have in this fight is that if she gets it down to the ground somehow, mm-hmm. she can win. She can maybe win. I'll, I'll, I'll give her that. But as I always say, a fight starts standing up. And if it doesn't go to the ground uh, quickly, uh, it's going to be a short night for, for Emmy. And, but that, that being said, I think you said it best. I think this will be uh, Emmy's first loss by knockout. And it will be by Reina. Probably a body shot. Probably a devastating mm, body shot. Good call. I'm, good call. Um, and as for uh, the, the newly announced uh, Kintaro uh, Takizawa fight, listen, I became a, a big fan of Kintaro after, uh, after he had his fight with Sato. Takizawa, he, uh, he's a prospect as well, but I don't think he ha- will have... I think that Kintaro is... He has the same thing that Hagiwar is. There's just something about, about him as a fighter that's different from the rest of the people in his weight class. And I think that Kintaro, this should be... Not an easy win for Kintaro, but I think uh, I think he can finish uh, Takizawa pretty. I would say by round two, uh, presuming you know. I'm guessing. I don't know how long these fighters have known that they're gonna, they're going to be fighting. I'm hoping at least two weeks. Um, but even with well, like one, just thing, Andrew, all three fights are going to be contested three five minute rounds. That's true. That's true. Uh, uh, you know, I still think Kintaro wins this. I think uh, Ryzen uh, has big, big plans for Kintaro. I think they're eventually going to put a, him versus Kai Zakura, I guess, presumably, somewhere down the line. Uh, I think that's a fight they're going to try to make. But I think, yeah, I think we're going to see Kintaro continue on his winning streak. Uh, Christian, after you. Well, I mean, all I got to say is, Emmy Tommy Masu is going to take this L. <laughs> That's all I gotta say about that. Raina, she is right in a two fight win streak in mixed martial arts. Even though she's taken a lot of time doing shoot boxing and what have you, she has been a lot more consistent in the win column than Emmy Tommy Masu has, even though Tommy Masu has experience. But I do think that Raina is gonna finish Emmy off quick and possibly, maybe, if it does happen, if. Siohiham and Ayaka Hamasaki 4, I think, doesn't work out. Maybe we could see Raina versus Siohiham in a shoot boxing bout or in an MMA bout. Well, hopefully, you know, until the borders open for Japan, I think that that's very unlikely. That, that would be a great fight to happen, but 
right now it's the the the, the atom weight choices will be unfortunately very limited. Oh. And of course, we'll never get Ayaka and Reina because they train together. So that fight will never happen. So that's off the table. Oh, uh, well, so- <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, just uh, wait for Run Horizon episode two, you guys. That's all I'll say. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, well, we'll- Kentaro versus Takadawa goes. Kentaro is a monster. I think he's yeah. gonna probably go through Kentataki's hour in two and call it a wrap. Yeah. How about uh, your thoughts on Ishida Hagiwara, uh, Christian? Well, we did interview both fighters, right? Yeah. And both of them seemed pretty optimistic about this fight, right? Mm-hmm. I think it's going to probably be a knockdown, drag out fight all the way to the end. But I'm going to have to, and I know some people might think I'm confused. Like, what the fuck is this? T- what the fuck is this guy <laughs> talking about? But I'm going to have to go with the underground emperor on this one. I'm going to have to go with Kyohei because he got something to prove in knocking out somebody in Ashida who is a former champion level fighter for deep. He's got something to prove for his young career. You know, if Ryzen wants to keep a hold on him if he defeats Ashida. So yeah, I got Kyohei Hagiwara beating Ashida. Oh, I, I think I, I think Hagiwara is going to beat him as well. Like I said, uh, when I see a fighter make adjustments during a fight uh, and doesn't stick to the original game plan, which is what I'm presuming happened with uh, Hagiwara's Ryzen debut, that tells me that fighter is really, really smart. So whatever Ishida has planned, you know, he better have some backup plans as well because if Hagiwara can adapt, uh, I think that Hagiwara can can, can take that fight and you know can come from behind even the third round and and win. Um, so, uh, but yeah, I'm going to take over for the next match because it is a kickboxing match, Christian, if that's okay. Um, so they got all the particulars up here. Um, excuse me. Uh, the next fight, another kickboxing match, 55 kilograms, 121 pounds between Mutsuki Ibata, the twin brother of Rui Ibata. And when I say twin, I literally mean twin because they legitimately look the same. I could not tell the difference between the two of them when I was watching footage of their fights. They they are identical. And it's, as Mike Goldberg would say, virtually identical. Yeah, um, it's Misuki Ibata versus Rasta. So can you please talk more about them? Yeah, and uh, Ibata comes in at 5'5", five five, uh, 29 years old. Rasta, 5'3", five 23 years old. Rasta is a former Big Bang champion. Uh, that is a legit boxing, kickboxing promotion. That is not a pornography name. I can assure you. And uh, Ibata, <laughs> former uh, champion from WKBA, um, also trains. Obviously, brother of Rui Bata. They train together. Rui Bata, one of the best kickboxers, not named Tetsunatsukawa. Uh, Ibata, thirty-seven wins, twenty-seven KOs, three losses, three draws. Uh, Rasta, twenty-one wins, four KOs, five losses. One draw, uh, and I'll read what Ryzen put out there for these two fighters. They said that every weapon that Mutsuki has uh, is elite level and textbook material. Rasta, on the other hand, is very unorthodox. He switches, he moves all over the ring, and throws wild strikes. Ibata's accuracy and Rasta's mobility will be put to the test when they meet for their Ryzen debuts. And with that being said, Drake, um, don't know if you had time to... Uh, to study either of these two in depth uh, as much as you wanted to, but if you did, do you have a thought on who takes this? Yeah, you know, honestly, most of my kickboxing tape study and all that comes during these events and whatnot because, you know, I'm I'm more of an MMA-specific guy. Like, I, for, for an example, I just cannot stand boxing, like, straight-up boxing. I think it's, yeah. like, so boring and I just because I'm so used to watching MMA and seeing everything. So I do much prefer kickboxing and Muay Thai and pretty much every other combat sport aside from boxing, which is hilarious. But, so, yeah, when it comes to kickboxers and whatnot, I don't go out of my way compared to MMA. So, yeah, not too up to par on these guys just yet, but, of course, we'll get to see them on Sunday night, Sunday morning, I guess, for us. Um, and well, I'll, I'll say this like for you, it will probably be late night, Saturday night, because of course, yes, yeah, of course it's us. If Andrew and I are going to be stuck watching this, it's going to be us. That's going to be getting up through the late Sunday. I mean, the late Sunday night, early, the late Saturday night, early Sunday morning crowd. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> 
So for for notes on this fight, though, all I will say is that obvious. It's, it's got to be pretty obvious, right? That you you if you have Ibata here, have him win. Let's say assume he wins, and then Tension wins. They're going to be fighting at New Year's Eve, right? And it's the, the storyline's already there. Tension beat up his brother very badly. It writes itself. Oh yeah, that's true. Unless they get, unless Takuru signs the, uh, signs the dotted line, and then, you know, Ibata, you wait to the back of the line. Mm-hmm. We'll go fight the winner of, uh, of, uh, Kitagawa and, uh, uh, that fight. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, just also to note as well, Rasta apparently has another kickboxing match two weeks later on 10-11 for Rise. <laughs> So he better not get his ass kicked in this fight, or he may have to turn down turn down that uh, booking. And that's for the Rise Dead or Eleven uh, Dead or Alive show in Yokohama. Um, Christian, any uh, any thoughts on any winner? Any, any thoughts on this fight? I mean, I would say I'm undecided, but considering the fact that Ibata has a name behind him and the fact that his twin brother is also kicking ass, I'm gonna have to yeah. go with Misuki on this one. Oh, yeah, me too. Um, and I think the Ryzen thing put it best, you know. Rasta is very wild. Mitsuki, Mutsuki, excuse me, is very, I guess, traditional kickboxing. But I think they, they pair these two up against each other. I think they clearly want Ibada to win. I think Ibada should win. Should be a good fight nonetheless. And, you know, Takaru doesn't sign the dotted line. Maybe that's what we get for New Year's Eve. Uh, you know, repeat or not repeat, but uh, kind of similar to last year's uh, uh, New Year's Eve show, uh, instead of with the other Ibata brother, um, uh, that attention will probably kill, um, as well. Um, with that being said, Christian, uh, want to take on these two next, do you want to take on these two next lightweight fights, uh, that we have left before we go into the co main and main? Yes, let's go ahead and do that. Let's go ahead and get that out the way. Obviously, the next two fights are of equal importance to the Ryzen lightweight division, I guess, if you even want to call it that. It's Takasuke, the Jaguar Kume versus Satoru Kitaoka, and Yuki Kawana versus Koji Takeda. First of all, the particulars for Kume and Kitaoka. Takasuke, the Jag, Takase, shit. Sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm fucking flaming out here. <laughs> Takasuke, the Jaguar Kume. Let's see, come on, this shit is low. This shit is old and slower than fucking molasses. I'm sorry, y'all. It's hard for me to do this shit with a slow computer. Oh, wait, oh, wait, here we go, here we go. Takasuke the Jaguar Kume, 23-6-3 overall, 35 years old, born April 28, 1985, 5'7", last weighed in at 169.9 pounds in the 1FC lightweight division. He represents a live fighting out of Nagoya Aichi, Japan. Of course, his last fight was in 1FC. When he knocked out, I mean, when he defeated former Ryzen alum, Koshi Luxor Matsumoto, who got knocked out by Darren Cruikshank that one time. Other than that, he is the current lightweight king of Pancrase, who defeated fellow ex Ryzen alum Tom Santos in his most recent defense back on April 14, 2019, and has been a long time Pancrasian, in addition to being a former two time 1FC lightweight. I mean, a two-time former Road FC lightweight title challenger and a veteran of Shuto. His opponent, Crazy Eye Satoru Kitaoka, who holds a professional mixed martial arts record dating from Halloween 2000 to now, of 42 wins, 20 losses, and 10 draws. He represents the Lotus Camp, fighting out of Nara, Japan, he is 5 feet 7 inches tall, weighing in at 154 and a third pounds, fighting out of Shinjuku Face, Tokyo, Japan. He is an A-level shoot wrestler, a black belt in BJJ, and a black belt in Judo. But unfortunately for him, in his rising career, he's seen a hell of a lot of bad in him. As a matter of fact, 
all he has is bad. He's three and six. He's two and six in his rising career. Those two wins were via technical. Well, actually, those two wins were basically where he was dominant. He defeated Darren Crookshank via technical submission by way of guillotine choke, and he defeated Tatsuya Kawajiri, or what was left of him, via split decision. Other than that, his losses were just sad. A TKO loss to Yusuke Yachi, a KO loss to Diego Brandao, a TKO loss to Roberto Satoshi de Sousa, a TKO loss to Johnny Case via corner stoppage, of course. Decision losses to Kichi Strasa Kunimoto and Koji Takeda, and more recently he fought on his own Eastmost card, defeating somebody to a draw. I'm, I'm drawing a blank here, obviously. I can't really pick up the fucking name because this computer's running slow as shit. Oh, Sho Kogane, via time limit draw, because of course he was taken after the Brawl International formula of win via submission. Or knockout, or if not, it's a draw. Huh. Still, should be a fun fight, even though the Tapology Faithful has it at a impasse for Kume. 94% out of 100. In other words, they want to see... Co In other words, they want to see Kita Oka suffer. In the next fight, in the lightweight division, of course, this is at 71 kgs or 157 pounds. Yuki Kawana versus Yuki Kawana versus oh yeah Koji Takeda Kawana 16 4 and 5 overall 5 755.6 pounds with a 72 inch reach age 29 born February 5th 1991 in Yokosuka Kanagawa Japan representing Shinwa Sports Academy he is currently riding a two fight winning streak after being bounced out of the PFL on a three fight losing streak. He is the current Shudo World Lightweight Champion after defeating Shutaro Debana via straight right hand back on July the 12th. And of course, this will be his rising debut as he's a former Shudo welterweight title challenger. He fought former UFC veteran and pride veteran now Yuki Kotani. And he also fought former UFC veteran and I guess, Dream and Sengoku veteran Dice K. Nakamura, who recently got his first knockout of his career, I think. But other than that, Kawana's a veteran of Fighting Network Zest. And that's all you need to know about him. As for Koji Takeda, the former deep lightweight champion, he's 10 and 1 overall, 5'7, 155 pounds, age 25, born April, I mean, born August 13th, 1995. Representing Brave Jim, Misato, Tokyo, Japan. He fought once in Ryzen, losing to Damian Beatdown Brown at Ryzen 15. The same awkward fight card that had a Manny Pacquiao sighting when Tenshin Nasakawa beat Fritz Biotan like a drum. And oh, by the way, Takeda is still the deep lightweight champion because he just recently defended that belt twice. Against the man who will be opening up the main card, Jiri O'Hara. Of course, twice defeating Jiri via technical decision on October 22nd, 2019. And then submitting him via double wrist lock back on December 15th, 2019. This will be his first time fighting in Ryzen in almost 17 months. Still... Point of the matter is, the Tapology Faithful has it for, let's see, the Tapology Faithful has it for Takeda, 92% out of 100. So I have to ask, as I catch my breath and take a swig of water, who do y'all think has the advantage in these fights, and do y'all think that we'll potentially see the winners of these two fights face off against each other at a later date and time? Uh, after you, Drake. I really like that you bring that up because I think that this is kind of like a, a mini unofficial tournament of sorts. You know, you got three different organizational champions in here. You know, Kume from what Pancrase right now, and then Takeda is the deep, and then Shuto uh, champion is Yuki on the opposite side. So two champion versus champions in terms of other organizations. I mean, 
Yeah, why not match the winners of these against each other? And uh, both very interesting matchups, I think. Um, obviously, looking a bit more to a bit a bit forward to um, the Kume versus Kiteoka one, just because I feel like Kume. This could be. This is kind of perfectly set up for him to, you know, have a, a showcase performance a little bit, unfortunately, in Kitayoka's at, at his expense, right? Because that's kind of what he's been good for <laughs> recently, just to be honest, you know, with those, all the losses that you rattled off, those were all just tough ones to watch, but very good um, highlights for his opponents. And he's just getting up there in age, but hanging around for as long as he can. And, you know, it hasn't uh, gone too well for him, unfortunately. And, you know, Kume hasn't proven to be like a crazy incredible flashy um finisher or anything but he's incredibly well-rounded has skills wherever the fight goes and i think that he could you know finish kiteoka as long as he doesn't get caught on the ground so i don't know if he'll play around down there too much um but he, he could ice him on the feet if he catches him with something good uh, as for takeda and kawana um you know, Koji, I thought that he was a little bit too hesitant in that Damian Brown fight, which is why he ended up losing, um, even though it's dangerous to engage in a firefight with Damian Brown, of course. So it goes both ways there. But, um, you know, if he gets a little bit more aggressive in this one and pushes the pace and, and controls um, and does, you know, what he usually does by dictating the pace, uh, should be able to have success. But, um, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to both of these lightweight fights that I do, I do like. Matching the winners up, like you said. Oh, yeah. Also, here's the interesting thing about uh, Kume and Kitawoka. Neither have ever been submitted in an MMA competition as well. Interesting. Um, so, uh, Christian, I'm going to throw that off to you. Uh, uh, what do you think about these two fights and uh, your predictions for either? I mean, when it comes to the Kume Kitawoka fight, Shouldn't it basically be known as Kume's coming out party? <laughs> it should. Listen, Kito Oka took some... I, I'm surprised Ryzen called him back. Because after that beating he took from Johnny Case where he had to be stretched out, like, that's that's one of those beatings where, like, you retire after beating. Or, like, we don't call you back beating. Yeah, do your little... Your, and I, think, I thought that's why he created his own promotion, because I, I figured, listen, Ryzen was going was to call again, so he just formed his own promotion. You know, yeah. he just, you know the pro wrestling route, you know, how all Japanese pro wrestlers do when they're unhappy with their promotion, or home promotion, they leave and form their own promotion. So, I figured that was the reason why he uh, formed uh, Osmosis, Osmosis, or whatever it's, it's called. Osmosis. <laughs> yeah. Um... But apparently, no, apparently, I don't know, maybe because of the pandemic, maybe that's why they called him, because they need some lightweight to get his ass kicked uh, for somebody who they, uh, like uh, Drake said, has a, they have an unofficial uh, tournament going. Um, what about the Takeda uh, Kiwana fight? Kiwana fight, uh, Christian, what do you think? Hmm? Christian? Oh, sorry, sorry. I was getting off into watching Monday Night Football because the Las Vegas Raiders are about to make their debut. But what was the question you were trying to propose? I'm oh, sorry, your thoughts on the Takeda uh, Kiwana fight? Oh, yeah. This fight's going to probably be something fun to watch. I mean, I think Takeda and Kiwana definitely got something to prove, especially Takeda, considering the fact that he got demolished by Damian Beatdown Brown the last time out. And has gone mm -hmm. on to win twice over Jiri O'Hara in convincing fashion. Now, as far mm -hmm. as Kawana goes, he too is riding a two-fight win streak after getting trounced out the PFL. But, I mean, considering the fact that we don't see a lot of these fighters often, especially considering the fact that they fight in Deep and in Shudo, and Shudo don't air on the fight pass, and Deep has a hard time airing at all. I mean, I think it's going to be hard for, I think it's going to be a hard fought fight, but I don't see anything but a Takeda win in this one. I, mean, I, don't, see in a, I don't see anything but a Takeda win via decision in this one. Oh yeah, Takeda is, is not, is one, is not an exciting fighter, I think. That he that putting up with him up against Kiwana was prob is probably the best fight you could put up because I was I went to some of those PFL shows that they had in Northeast and Kiwana was at some of them and he was 
he was totally outclassed by all the, in all those fights um, that he was in in PFL. Um, I think, yeah, that should be an easy win for Takeda. Kume, uh, Kiloka, I'm slightly, I'm more interested from a grappling point of view because I'd be, I would love to see, it's kind of like with Kiloka De Souza. I would just want to see it go to the ground and see what happens there. But probably that's not going to happen. Kume's smart. He won't even try to engage Kiloka on the ground. It'd be interesting if he did, but that probably is not his best interest. Obviously, Kiloka's strength has never been on the stand-up. He has never knocked out anybody or even come close. I don't think he's ever knocked out. Uh, he's knocked down anybody. I can't recall. But that's where Kume's strength is going to be. Is going to be knocking out Kitawoka, which, let's be honest, I think can happen pretty quickly, especially after the beatings he's taken in Ryzen. Uh, or just, just, just his entire career. Um, yeah, I think Kume by KO, Takeda, I think he'll probably grind out a decision. I don't know. I know that Drake, you brought the point that he looked very hesitant at fight. Um... I, I don't know. Well, hopefully, you know, maybe he got the uh, first time jitters out. That would be mm-hmm. great. But, you know, I don't know. Let's, let's hope that he's not like a younger Yachi where he, you know, he just, you know, kind of, kind of chokes under the, uh, under the big lights for his fights. Um, when, uh, when the uh, bell rings, I, I, you know, but if Takeda, if, if Takeda doesn't win this, then I will believe that, yeah, he's a guy who cannot fight on a big stage because there's just something about Fighting in deep that he can do versus fighting in front of five thousand people, sold out five thousand uh uh crowd that he can't do for some reason. Um, that being said, Christian, let's take on this co main event, and I'm gonna try not to be so angry because I do hate non title matches with champions, so I'll try to keep it as professional as possible. You have a sad thing for, I mean. You have a basic turnoff for non-title fights, especially in Ryzen, where anything can happen. Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll try to keep it professional, but uh, <laughs> with that being said, go on ahead. Let's get these particulars for this, for this co-main event Phantom Wave match. Okay, but calm down, Andrew. It's just a fight. It is just <laughs> a fight. And what a fight this should be, even though it is a non-title bout. Shoji, the Samurai Maruyama, well, actually, Samurai Shoji Maruyama versus the upset special, the rising bantamweight champion, Kai Asakura, in a non-title bout. First of all, the particulars for Shoji Maruyama, 5 feet 7 inches tall, weighing in at 144.8 pounds. He is 37 years of age. On April the 24th, 1983, and representing the Toikatsu Dojo in Nabari Mie, Japan, he is currently riding a two fight winning streak, knocking out Makoto Kamaya, knocking out Kosuke Terashima. He lost to Takeya Mizugaki, he lost to Kochi Isizuka. Oh, and uh, by the way, he is a former. I mean, let's see, is he, is he a former? Deep lightweight champ? No, no, it doesn't say it here. Oh, he's a former deep featherweight title challenger and, of course, a one-time veteran of Dream. But also, more particularly than that, he got the fastest knockout in JMMA history one point in time. I think he knocked out Umakanov or something. I don't know. It wasn't Pancras. But it was a three-second knockout. And he did get that win by the same way that Kid Yamamoto knocked out knocked out little Hercules Kazuyuki Miyata. And he also fought a young Jose Aldo in Pancras as well and lost. But still, you can't deny that. Now as far as Kai Asakura goes, 15-2 and two overall. The Ryzen Bantamweight Champion of the World. He stands in at 5 feet 8 inches tall. Weighs in at 134.2 pounds for this special attraction at 61 kilos or 135 pounds. He represents the Triforce Jiu-Jitsu Academy. Was born on... No... Ah, damn it. I'm sorry. I'm kind of mixing up things a little bit. He's 26 years old, born Halloween 1993 in Toyohashi Aichi, Japan. 
He represents the Triforce Jiu-Jitsu Academy in the styles of Zendo Kai and Sumo and fights out of Toyohashi Aichi Japan by way of his training grounds in... Sorry, doing this on the fly. <laughs> Representing Triforce Jiu-Jitsu Academy in... Yeah, in uh, Tokyo, I believe. Uh, yeah, but not just... Ah, damn it, I'm sorry. This damn computer of mine is just loading so slowly. Not just in Tokyo, but in Toshima, Tokyo, Japan. <coughs> Still, point of the matter is... Ever since the Asakura brothers been in the Rising Fighting Federation, they've been near perfect. Kai, for instance, has gone on a... Six win. Well, actually, he's seven and one in Rising. The only blemish to his career was that loss to Manel Cape on New Year's Eve, back at Rising 20, of which he defeated him. He defeated him controversially in their first meeting, where Manel Cape was just showboating too much at Rising 10, which was also on the same night that Tenshin Nasukawa. And Kyoji Horiguchi got quick knockout victories, and in the case of Horiguchi, sending Ian Uncle Creepy McCall into retirement. But, still, Asakura just won the Rising Bantamweight Championship, just became the third Rising Bantamweight Champion back on August the 10th, knocking out Hiromaso Hikubo with a first round soccer kick barrage. And of course, Tapology Faithful. They're not showing Maruyama any mercy. 95% have a win for Asakura. But, considering how much you love non-title fights so much, Andrew, I want to get your opinion first on this fight. How do you think well, this fight will play out? Well, it's stupid. I really think it's a stupid thing. I, I don't believe in adding miles to your champions. Here, The show was sold out anyway when they announced Koji. I think I think this this five thousand C audience is going to be like ninety percent Koji fans and ten percent other people. Uh, so you didn't really need a Kai fight, really, uh, business wise. Um, if, you know, if you listen, Kai should win this easily, hands down. This should not even be a a a, a competitive fight. Uh, if if Shoji wins this, you just mucked up the bandweight division because now. You, now he gets he should get a title shot for being champion in a non-title match, and then listen if Kai gets injured in this fight, he may have to vacate. It just it just it just it just a domino effect of bad things that can happen. Um, and we you know like with Horiguchi getting the ACL tear um, uh, after this fight. Uh, I, I should say after this fight, but after the Kai non-title match, yeah, it's just it's just it's just not good. It's just not good. I don't like it, Drake. Your thoughts? You know, I totally understand the, you know, the dislike for non-title fights for sure. I mean, I felt that way about uh, Kai versus Kyoji the first fight. I was like, oh, I mean, why, why we got to do that? Just make it for the title, you know, even though obviously people weren't expecting Kai to go in there and be competitive whatsoever. But, wow, we got the crazy upset, one of the greatest upsets of all time, really. Um, you know, obviously that would be a huge one here if Shoji pulls that off. But it's not like he's a, a young rising star like Asakura was going against Horiguchi. Um, so highly unlikely there, but he is a veteran, you know, he's, he's got power in his hands. He's definitely capable of, you know, hurting people and getting finishes and whatnot. But we're talking about kind of the new generation, one of the best bantamweights in the world right now. Kai Asakura is showing to be on, an, on another level. And I think that that loss to Manel Cape really helped to take him there as we saw in that, uh, Ogi Kubo fight. Yeah. yeah. He should absolutely be able to walk away with this one and, you know, just add to his highlight reel and make that uh, potential rematch with Kyoji at New Year's Eve even bigger uh, that's that's not uh, me dropping any news that's just you know predicting what might happen or you know even a potential Archuleta crossover fight at some point which would be awesome there's so many options in the Bantamweight division between Bellator and Ryzen right now um, so yeah this, this should theoretically that, if Shoji wins you would then have to give him the child shot over yeah. Kyoji because you just made you, you just you just you basically muck up your own plans basically yeah yeah, exactly. And you know, assuming that that if that was to happen, then I would say, all right, let's do Horiguchi versus Archuleta. Let's 
let's do that then. You know, at that around the same time as whenever they do this rematch. So I uh, thankfully they do have options, but I think that we should be okay well, here see, with Kai the, getting the win. I don't think they have options though. I think that's because you know a lot of right. is great to make. But until Japan opens up its borders, they're going to be limited in fights. And that's why I think it's even more important now to preserve your fighters for future um, fighters like Kai for future fights. And listen, anything can happen in a fight. You know, he steps the wrong way. Boom. His ACL tears. Imagine that. Imagine yep. Kai tears his ACL out for six months and he has to vacate the title. Now we're back to square one. And now we have to do this whole thing again. I'll say this, though. With the QOD thing, it kind of worked out. Luckily, now though, I don't know if they can get Koji. I'll assume they can because he is a Japanese citizen. But, you know, it, it, let's just say, you know, Koji, you know, still not, you know, still not 100% you know, uh, with, his, uh, with his health. And he can't take the fight. Is it Kai injures himself? Who do they have next in 135? Kintaro? I don't think Kintaro's that, at that level yet. And you don't want to risk Kai, your, I would say, second or third biggest star in your company risking injury in a non-title fight against a guy who, yeah, showed you should have win, but, the, but you know what? He, you can still win. Listen, Anderson Silva was still beaten twice uh, in, uh, in Japan when he was at the top of his game. It can happen any time, and it can just ruin whatever ideas you have. Yeah, you're totally right there, and so... It'll be interesting. To see. That's what makes it interesting, right? It's like, oh, the potential for all this madness to unfold. But yeah, business-wise, I mean, yeah, there is that, that negative side, all the, the domino effect that could happen there. But then it's also like, hey, well, we got a superstar on this card. Do, do they need it necessarily, though? That, that's the good point that you also presented. Yeah. Um, don't know about that. Um, they saw the show way before they announced this fight, so I can't believe that, that they... If, if they were, if this show wasn't selling tickets or wasn't doing well, I could kind of understand. I'd be like, okay, you need to put another fight there and Kai fight with Ozzy to do that. But they sold out when they, oh, they sold out way before they announced this fight. This fight was only announced, I think, about two weeks ago, and they already sold out by then. And I heard that uh, Koji's tickets were the ones that that sold out the most. So it wasn't like they needed this fight business wise. They were good enough. They sold out Saitama. Yeah. I mean, also, you know, it could also be that, like, Kai wanted to stay active for, for whatever reasons, you know, keep, mm -hmm. you know, he didn't get the fight for the first half of the year, as so many did, and, you know, he's the champion now, so he has that option. Like, yeah, sure, we'll throw you on there, man. Why not? <laughs> so Champion's Request could also play a part in it. Um, and, you know, he's already got the New Year's Eve one lined up, according to him, as, you know, so uh, no idea who the opponent is yet, but, of course, trying to stay busy, it seems, at the very least, is he. Um, ultimately, though, in this fight, yeah, should should it's be so a good finish for him. So I'll, I'll give him the first-round knockout. Yeah, I'll, I'll, it's so funny. It seems like he wants to fight but his brother doesn't want to seem to want to fight at all it's like it's like a tale of two brothers like it's literally like they're like you know they're, they're comparing them to the diaz brothers and like one of them is like the diaz brothers and the other one's kind of like Connor at this point where he just talks more about fighting than actual fighting um <laughs> christian your thoughts on this fight christian hmm Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry to take away from, from uh, MNF, uh, Monday Night Football. Uh, thoughts on uh, Asakura Shoji? Oh, my thoughts on Kai Asakura versus Shoji. I mean, you've seen the press conference. I don't know if you've seen it, Drake, but you've seen the press conference where Maruyama, Shoji Maruyama, just looked completely bored, like he just didn't want to be there. Yeah. And he, also, he looks like he's 50 years old, by the way. He's only in his 30s, but he looks like he's 50. <laughs> true, true, true. But still, point of the matter is, the dude, I mean, you can't doubt Shoji's skills. You can't doubt the fact that this dude, you know, once knocked the guy out in three seconds and lived to tell the tale about it. But still... Point of the matter is, I just don't think that this man is going to be able to defeat Kai Asakura because he's younger, he's faster, he has a lot more skill set compared to him. And, by the way, he's the champion. If he doesn't lose, if he doesn't win this fight, I mean, what value is that going to make for the Rising Bantamweight title? I mean, what yeah. prestige does that set for that title? 
Exactly. Um, and basically, yeah, Kai should win this, and uh, not only for his sake, but also for Ryzen's sake. Because if he doesn't, it's gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna just, it's not gonna be good. It won't be good for for all parties involved, except for Shoji. Because Shoji can say, "I beat Kai." Give me a title shot or whatever. Um, but yeah, I think, uh, we're all picking out Sakura, right? We're, of we're course. All, we're Shoji, right? Oh yeah, we're all picking Kai Sakura. Uh, I mean, stranger things have happened in MMA, you know, but on paper, there's nothing that, that I see that Shoji can do that Azakura can't do much better um, at, at, at this stage in either of their careers. Um, with that being said, Christian, let's talk about this main event, uh, the return of tension. Uh, after you, whenever you're ready. Uh, yeah, let's go ahead and talk about the main event. The fight that everybody's gonna want to park their ass in a seat for the fight that's gonna probably get the most views on the replays on the rising fighting federation youtube channel the fight that everybody should timestamp and say where was i when this happened it's gonna be the fight that everybody's gonna be talking about hopefully for a long time it's koji tanaka versus Ninja Boy, Shindo Tenshinasukawa. First of all, for Emperor Kenji, no, for Emperor Koji Tanaka, the particulars. He was born May 6, 1989, in Osaka. He's 5 feet 8 inches tall, weighs in at 132.3 pounds for this contest, being 58 and a half kilos. Or about 130 pounds, if I'm not mistaken. 132 at the latest. He is a kickboxing and Shorenji Kempo karate competitor who has an orthodox stance. Fighting out of Team Silver Wolf and Team One in Nishi, Osaka, Japan. He was the 2012 Tribe Latte Kick Super Featherweight Champ. The 2013 Heat Kick Featherweight Champion, I mean Heat Kick Lightweight Champion, my apologies. And he was the former ISKA World Lightweight Champion, defeating Mohamed Bolef at Heat 39. But he's more particularly known for his accomplishments in K1. Or lack thereof, I guess. <laughs> he is the 2019 Combat Press Fighter of the Year, coming back from... Getting beaten down by Seiya Kawahara at the 2019 K1 World Grand Prix Yokohama Matsuri event back on November 24th to knock him out. And of course, he is a veteran of Crush, Rebels, J Network, Nagoya Kick, and Rise, of course. But he is also a former K1. World Grand Prix K Festa Tournament semi finalist. So there's that on him. And he also has a professional kickboxing record of 28 wins, 13 losses, and 2 draws, with 10 of those 28 wins by way of KO. And now for the man you all came to hear about the man who just can't stop fighting in your dreams <laughs> Ninja Boy Tenshin Asukawa. 22 years old, born August 18, born August 18, 1998, in Matsudo, Chiba, Japan, fighting out of Nerima, Tokyo, Japan. He's five feet five inches tall, 126.8 pounds, representing his own team, Team Teppin. He has a 4-0 mixed martial arts record with two knockouts and one submission. An amateur kickboxing record of 105 wins, 5 losses and 1 draw with 62 wins by way of knockout. And a professional MMA record of 37 wins, no losses. 29 of those 37 wins by way of knockout. He is the current ISKA Unified Rules Featherweight Champion. The current Rise Featherweight Champion. The current Rise World Series Tournament Champion. And the former ISKA Oriental Rules Bantamweight Champion. Oh, and if you want to deny that stupid ass 
Floyd Mayweather fight. He is the... He, obviously, is the winningest fighter in the history of the Rising Fighting Federation. The winningest fighter in the history of the Rising Fighting Federation. As a matter of fact, he's won... Let's see... The two kickboxing bouts on New Year's Eve 2017, defeating Yusaku Nakamura, defeating Kyoji Horiguchi, Fritz Arton, Biarton, Martin Blanco, do do do, Rui Ibata. Oh, and his four MMA bouts. So yeah, he's 10 and 0, or 9 and 0 actually, inside the Rise and Fighting Federation ring. If you want to discount that Floyd Mayweather bullshit that he had to go through, but still, he is a legend in the making. And he's not even 25 years old yet. But still, do you think, I mean, first of all, how fast do you think that Nasukawa will win this? And do you think that there's anything left for him after this if he does defeat Koji? After you, Drake, give us all your delicious thoughts on this fight. <laughs> Here they come. Um, you know, man, it's just crazy you know, tension in general, because he's become one of those guys where, you know, there are just those certain fighters who you simply cannot go against until you see them lose, right? And he's already at that for how young he is. It's really insane. You know, he said legend in the making. You could argue he's already a legend for what he's done so far. Um, and yet, how quickly will he win? Who knows about that? I think that, you know, you look at Koji and he's obviously very good in his own right, but it's just one of those things where, like, it, it, it's probably still not enough, you know, no matter how good he is. Um, and so, yeah, you got to go attention here, you think, right? So I don't know how quickly, you know, first round, probably second round at the latest. Um, how specifically, then you never know with him, right? He's throwing rolling thunder kicks. He'll do whatever he has to to win. Um, what could be next for him? It is a three, three minute round fight. Very true, very true, which uh, that always kind of annoys me. I wish for a little bit more, but, you know, it is what it is. Um, anything left for him next? Well, obviously alluded to that that Ibata twin brother rematch, uh, not rematch, but, you know, fighting uh, Mutsuki. Um, that's something, obviously, because there's a story there. He'll, of course, probably win that one again as well, but there's a story there for what could be next. Obviously, everyone's, everyone wants to see the Tekaru fight, um, but there's... There's there's a couple options I think, but yeah, he's already clearing things out for the most part, which is incredible. Um, so I don't know. Do you guys have anybody in mind for the future of tension? Well, it would have to just be Takaru. I'll tell you for one thing that he does have a future date coming up on November the first. Ah, oh, that's right. That is right. Against Mr. Rise Yuki at the Rise Dead or Alive Osaka show, but other than that. I just don't know what the hell to tell you. <laughs> oh, here's, well, here's the thing. I think it's best said that, listen, the tension is so above everybody else that the problem is that if you match him with anybody, you're just going to have such a, uh, such a, a, a discrepancy in talent that there's really, it's really, when you miss, if you match anybody besides Takuru against tension, it's really a mismatch if you think about it. I mean, I would say this, Koji... And I know that when Ibata, when, the, when Rui Ibata got the fight against Tenshin, and then uh, Tenshin had the the, uh, the fight against, uh, I think it was Kakihara uh, in Rise this year for the retur Rise Return Show. So there were there were kickboxing fans who were saying that those were two fights were going to be Tenshin's toughest fights, and mm -hmm. you saw what he did to both of them, and especially Ibata of all. Yeah, jeez. Um, and. But I will say this with cause this will this could potentially be uh tensions for his level toughest fight. Uh Koji is a southpaw. Tension has said in the past that he does have trouble with southpaws. Um I think he's actually never knocked out a southpaw. I think that's what he said. I could be incorrect though. Um but I know he has mentioned something about southpaws. Um also, as well, I don't know if you had a chance to see this, Drake or Christian. Did you see that? Um, actually, our our uh, translator LJ translated a tweet from Koji, who said that he hopes he'll be able to fight, uh, and that, that there's some difficulties going on, 
uh, that's on a different level. Did you happen to see that that uh, posted? Absolutely. Great. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I don't, as of now, this fight is still on, but I don't know if it's a weight thing or something personal. Um, but it looks like this. Th- there might be some issue going on with this fight just a few days from now. Hopefully, it's not a, a COVID a positive test. That yeah. was absolutely devastating. Same, but I'm just keeping that just keeping that in mind as well. This because this main event, if something happens, it could be scrapped, and we might have Kai Zakura versus Shoji as a main event. Um, if uh, if whatever Koji is saying, you know, if it's really that bad and it prevents him from fighting, um, I you know, I mean, yeah, th- this will probably be, but I think attention is still gonna win, like overwhelmingly. He's gonna knock. I think he's gonna knock out. I think I think by second round he knocks out Koji. Um, I know that Koji will have a little bit of a size advantage, but that's never mattered for tension. Yeah. For weather. Co- uh, tension is just at a different... Listen, no fight will matter for tension until the Takaru fight. Excuse me, the Takaru fight. Like, there's nothing. You really... There's really... You have nothing for him. It's, you're just gonna be... Everybody who is he... Who you're gonna feed to him. I, I should say feed, but everybody you match up against, they're just gonna get defeated. They're gonna get defeated. And that's just what's always going to happen. Um, I really can't think of anybody uh, that's like on Tetch's level. It's really that much of a mis- mis- uh, mismatch. Uh, Christian, you're obviously, obviously, aside from this fight and the fight he got against Koji coming up, I mean, what the hell is there really for him to do other than Gore Takaru into another fight? If he doesn't get the Takaru fight, then what'll be next? Another fight with a Floyd Mayweather prospect or forcing Javante Tank Davis to travel all the way around the world just to get his ass Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. Yeah. At this point, it's it's really just exhibition fights for tension at this point. It really is. There's really nobody... Yeah, Takaru is the only person. I wouldn't. No, I don't even hear about Javante Davis at this point. I'm glad. That, I'm glad at least the pandemic can prevent that fight from happening uh, in the near future. Um, I mean, I mean you know they what, do- one thing. You know what? The other thing that can be preventative: him going to one FC, and I hope that shit doesn't happen. That's true. That's true. Um, um, I guess. Uh, I mean. What you said, Drake, you know, that this, you know, I guess, yeah, for New Year's Eve, it, it would probably be either Ibada or it has to be Takaru. I don't know what other fight that you can make, you can make that would have, you know, that it's, it's like, it's like Mike Tyson at this point. You just wait for the knockouts because you know it's going to happen. That's what, that's what it has become to at this point. The tension is, is Mike Tyson. It's not if, <laughs> but when. Um, <laughs> Well, that Until said, Buster Douglas comes along. <laughs> no, no, oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, Listen, yeah. here's the thing. If Koji wins, if Koji wins, this will, it, it, this, it will, it will probably, it will, yeah, that would be, that would be more new. That would, out of everything that happens on the card, yeah. uh, even if Shoji beats Kai's Kura, if Koji wins, then, yeah, that would be, like, that would be, like, major, major news. And, in terms of upset, how big of an upset? Where, where would you put the over under on an upset like that for Koji? Mm, man, I mean, I, I don't know what we could compare it to because you know it depends on if he if he's to actually finish tension as opposed to a decision. You know, it would be a lot bigger of a deal if he was able to finish tension. Um, so let's assume he did that. I mean. It's up there, I mean, because like we're saying, you know, no one is expecting Tension to lose at this point. So once somebody, you know, actually makes that happen, it's like, it's going to be quite a big deal. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know what I could really put it next to, but obviously it would be massive. I don't know. Do you have some, some other fight in mind? Uh, I can't think. I'll, he's not going to do any MMA at this point, he said. Yeah, there's really nothing. There's really nothing at this point. Yeah, listen, if they make Ibada... Uh, uh, twin brother Ibada versus Tension. That'll be another easy fight for Tension. You can't convince me otherwise. Yeah, it just has to be top for New Year's Eve. Hopefully that fight happens. It would, that would be the biggest fight that Ryzen K1 can possibly do. And it's the one that's, it's that big what if. That's you like, know, this is maybe a little bit off track here, but I'm, I'm curious what you guys think. Um, so when he fought Horiguchi, right? Um, in my opinion, I thought that Horiguchi, I might have to go watch it again, but I thought Horiguchi was kind of on his way to winning that fight until the end when Tension kind of hurt him late, like within the last minute. Yeah. I thought that Horiguchi did absolutely incredible against Actually, Tension. 
It's so funny. Probably the fire that he did, that that that, that matched up the best with tension was yeah. a person who was not a kickboxer. That was the first kickboxing match. Um, so yeah, I would love to see I, that rematch I, personally. I don't think he was. From what I can recall, he wasn't You're talking winning. Talking about the Amrat Ruin Wrong fight, right? The one with the champion boxer, not named Mayweather. Wait, wait, wait. What are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, he had a fight earlier in his career against the former WBA boxing champion, Ambrat Ruinrong. Oh, Intention? Mm-hmm. Oh, no, no, we're talking about Horiguchi Intention. Oh, yeah. right, 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 of course, of course. I, I, don't recall, I don't recall Horiguchi winning. I remember him doing well, but I don't know if I recall him winning. That third round, definitely, he did not win. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, Horiguchi got rocked I'm by Intention. So, yeah, it's true, funny. I would probably say that fight is similar in nature to the Kid Yamamoto Masato fight. Yeah. And that's what they were trying to emulate um with that fight. But I mean yeah, I think Dre I think you, that's 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 who his toughest opponent was up to this up to this date. Well the only other kickbox you could do is Rotang, but he's in one and that yeah. that won't happen for the foreseeable future. Um so that's the only other fight you could potentially do, but you know, Rotang stuck in uh, one and also Thailand. Um, with that being said, uh, Drake, I want to get your thoughts. Which fight are you looking forward to the most, and why is it Sidario versus Dylan James? <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> oh, man, which fight am I looking forward to the most, though, on a real note? Um, hmm. Man, I don't know. I don't know. There's. Let's see here. So, some good options here. Obviously, I like I like the kind of showcase we have here with three of these lightweight matchups. You know, obviously, you know, it it, it might actually be Yauchi's fight to open the the night up, just because I want. I'm really curious to see, man, if he can kind of erase our recent memories of him and you know look really phenomenal here and uh, get the win that he absolutely needs. Um, but of course, always looking forward to Kayasakura, you know, fighting absolutely anybody. Um, you know, Kume's debut is really interesting to me. Of course, there's going to be a highlight from the main event no matter what happens. Um, but as in terms of an actual fight, instead of specific people, it, it might actually be Yachi versus Ohara to kick things off. <laughs> mm-hmm. How about you, Christian? I mean, for me, obviously the main fights I'm going to be looking forward to are the co-main event and main event. Shoji versus Kai and Tension versus Koji. But in a way, I think I'm gonna probably be looking more towards. Uh, let me go ahead and check. I think I'm gonna probably be looking more towards the Sudario James Radine fight. <laughs> Especially because of the fact that you got two big boys who normally don't do MMA. Trying to kick each other's ass. You got two big boys looking to just beat the living shit out of each other. And I hope that Sudario wins. But other than that, the other fights that I'm probably most certainly looking forward to. The other fights that I'm looking forward to are the Kentaro versus Takizawa fight. Because that was just announced. And the... Two lightweight bouts near the end. Kume versus Kitaoka and Takeda versus Kawana because it's like y'all said, it's pretty much a mini tournament from this point out. You know, you yeah. have these lightweights looking to prove themselves because Ryzen actually is trying to build a lightweight division. Mm-hmm. Uh, I gotta go with Sidario Dylan James. It's the fight that stands out for me the most. So listen, doesn't mean it's... Oh, it's uh, uh, I'm looking forward to all the fights in their own individualness, but this is the one I'm just like, I'm the most interested in just seeing how it goes. The other fights, I'm from a fighting perspective and analyze them. Obviously, a lot more takeaways from that. But this one, I'm just like, I am I am so, like, it can, it can go so many ways. You got a pro wrestler in there, and you, you never, when these pro wrestlers do MMA, Whenever they try to do pro wrestling stuff like the Yumiko Hota, Gabby Garcia match, when you do, like, it, it, it presents a wackiness that is very rare in, in MMA and can be very, very entertaining to watch. 
like Cam so that uh, the Cam Soda show or the uh, well, Full Metal the, Dojo show that just the, happened. Yeah, the two Cam Soda shows, Cam Soda yes. Legends and Full Metal Dojo Fight Circus <laughs> Volume One. <laughs> So if you had to, had to put, a, put a gun to my head for uh, interesting, uh, which fights I'm more interested in from a fighting perspective. Tension, Koji, it's Tension's most, it's a fight that he will probably have, it'll, it'll be his toughest in, in relative terms of Tension uh, fight to date, probably. Well, that's not saying a lot, but it's still an interesting fight from a stylistic perspective. Reina, Emi Tomimatsu, again, I love stylistic mismatches. You got kick, a kickboxer, shootboxer versus a grappler. I just love things. I like seeing uh, stylistic matches like that. And then another fight, uh, Kume and Kitaoka, two guys who have never been submitted. I want to see somebody get submitted. And if it goes down to the ground, if it does, I'm going to be a happy man because I love seeing I love seeing guys who are, who are like BJJ uh, uh, wizards take to the ground and not stand because that's when it becomes like a very interesting cat and mouse game and I get very entertained by that. Sorry to say, Yachi's fight I'm not looking forward to because <laughs> it's Yachi. If he wins, I'm happy. If he doesn't, well, you know, I guess just, you know, Yachi things, I guess. Um, <laughs> I think overall, great show. Um, I think it's, it looks good on paper and I think it will definitely deliver in terms of exciting fights. Um... And yeah, you know, no, no, no double shows. So I'm happy about that. We just get one show this weekend, uh, running concurrently with a thousand other MMA shows. It seems like this week. Not to uh, mention, not to mention, it's gonna be running concurrently with an offering from Pancrase at the same exact time on YouTube. Oh yes, yes. Oh god, oh god. Those pan- the pan- last Pancrase show was eight hours long, so I might have to watch that like after. After I'm done watching Ryzen. Uh, with that being said, Drake, I want to give you the opportunity to plug everything that you're doing, social media, anything else that you got going on. This is uh, your time to get all of your plugs out. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me, guys. This this was awesome, you know, getting to talk about some great fights that we're going to be seeing here. Always fun. Um, So, yeah, what do I got going on? Of course, obviously, Broaden Horizon is kind of my big, current, continuous project, the podcast, of course, which you can watch on my MMANews.com, YouTube. You can listen just to audio only on the Loudmouth MMA Podcast Network, uh, SoundCloud, you know, my MMA News is SoundCloud, all that stuff. fits everywhere, video, audio. Um. And then, of course, you know, catch all my articles and writing stories, whatever they may be, interviews and all that. Um, at my, you know, just follow me on Twitter. You can see it all there. So at Drake Riggs underscore. Um, in terms of. Oh, and of course, you know, my other podcast, the WMA Today podcast, which is every Wednesday live at 630 p.m. Pacific time. That is on the Scraps YouTube channel. And, uh, yeah, I guess those are really the big ones. You know, just look forward to the Broadened Horizon Episode 2, which uh, should be out by Wednesday. And we are recording here on Monday, of course. So what is that, Wednesday, the 23rd of September? Um, yeah, just always working on other things There's, you know, that I forget about. But, uh, like I said, you can see it all on my Twitter if you give me a follow. And uh, just also uh, your Twitter account. Uh, what's your Twitter account again? At Drake Riggs underscore. Okay, great, great. Uh, and Christian, uh, take us out. Okay, that's it for us for now. We thank y'all for enjoying this special edition of the We Are Rising podcast. And yeah, even though we are completely different from Broughton Horizon, we'll admit it, we don't get Shingo Kashiwagi, we don't have all the cool guests like Drake Riggs does, but one thing that we are is that we are trying to bring y'all all all there is to know about Japanese MMA, all there is to know about combat sports, and we appreciate y'all, no matter what y'all listen to, for help getting the word out. Whether it via your text, your tweets, your listens, or you putting us over like a... or you putting us over like a prized possession... You know, we enjoy y'all listening to our show. We enjoy y'all listening to Drake's show. We enjoy y'all listening to anything that helps us put over this niche little thing we call Japanese mixed martial arts or Japanese combat sports. And we thank y'all, again, for enjoying everything there is to know from us, from our perspective about the Ryzen Fighting Federation and Japanese combat sports. Other than that, again, check us out on Twitter. 
at Chris Gary 92 at a binger one at Drake Riggs underscore at my MMA news. Is that correct, Drake? That is. Mm-hmm. And at we are rising pod. So until next time, fight fans. We thank y'all for listening to us on the We Are Rising podcast. We thank y'all for spreading the word about JMMA. And until the next time we hear y'all, take us home, Lenny Hart. And on that note, we are officially out of this mug. Thank y'all. Talk to y'all soon. Peace out. Take care, everybody. Later.